Podcast City Network. Hey guys, this is Chris of Final Score and the Podcast City Network, and we are back live at City Limits Tap Room. And you know, it's always exciting when we're here because we are here as part of Draft Day. We're going to taste test, t- taste test. Look, I've already been drinking too much. Already? Clearly. Already, uh, clearly. Yes, you know, I, I, I thought I had just a little bit, but you know. <laughs> a little bit more never hurt, right? No, no, it never hurts. Just throw a little on top, it'd be all right. But. Again, we are here for draft day at City Limits. It's been a long time since we've had one, and you haven't been able to be a part of one yet. Yeah, this is my first draft day. I'm really excited. It should be a lot of fun. Today. I mean, at least you got, well... I'm trying to look somewhat professional here, okay? Well, the crap doesn't come off. That's okay. <laughs> so at least it's not a big yellow M, you know, so... But we'll get more into college sports later. <laughs> Anyways, we are here for draft day. It's going to be really exciting. If you are watching us live, that means you're watching us on Twitch at twitch.tv backslash podcast city network. Definitely make sure that you give us a subscribe, a follow, a like, drop us some comments. We're going to be reading them as we do the show. And then make sure you also follow us on all of our social media outlets for the podcast city network on Facebook at backslash podcast city network on Twitter at podcast city net. And of course, our website podcastcity.net. And of course, where can they find final score? You can find them all over the place. We've got Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher. I'm forgetting one. iHeartRadio. Google Play Music. Google Play Music. Yeah, we're everywhere. And then we're, and then on social media. Social media, we've got at PCN Final Score on Twitter and on Facebook. Yeah, so definitely make sure you go check us out. Give us a like. Give us a follow. And keep up to date on all the things we have going on. Because we have so much going on and a lot of the big announcements that we're going to save for later. So... Live in fear or anticipation. I guess it really wouldn't be fear. I don't know. I've had too much to drink already. But speaking of fear, speaking of fear, we do need to talk about the NBA because there's been a lot of insanity in this ever unfolding L.A. Lakers saga. Where are we at now in this whole thing? So just a few days ago, the senior writer at ESPN, Baxter Holmes, put out a story on ESPN.com titled Lakers 2.0, The Failed Reboot of the NBA's Crown Jewel. And this story reveals so much about what was going on behind the scenes of the LA Lakers organization. Magic Johnson, Rob Palenka, and all of the all of the anticipation that came up when they first came on, and then how quickly things turned and went sour mm-hmm. as they got started. I tell you what, this has just been an insane saga. And there's been so many... There's so much coming from every side with LeBron wanting to try and recuse himself from a lot of this and really not talk much about it until recently, I heard. Yeah, so supposedly he's never really been much of a fan of Luke Walton, their ex-head coach, who's Definitely now not. with the Sacramento Kings. But there was he was always trying to keep himself out of it. But uh, turns out his agent was not quite as quiet about a lot of this stuff. Ooh. For, from sources that were in this story... He was apparently granted unprecedented access as an agent to the charter planes, behind the scenes, just in the front office. He was always around in practices, and there was always a level of not only fear, but it's just a, they called it a, quote, culture killer. Wow, that, that's pretty extreme. Of clutch sports involved in all of the things that are going on in the in the front office and obviously he was there the year before because he's his, one of his clients is Contavious Caldwell Pope, who's also mm-hmm. on the team. Apparently he was there, quote, scouting Luke Walton to see if he'd be a viable viable coach for LeBron James to play under. Well, that that's that just seems ridiculous to me. Like, really? But uh, reading in more to this story, Baxter Holmes points out that not only were was he granted this access, the the front office of Rob Palenka and Magic Johnson bent over backwards for him, basically let him do almost whatever it was that he wanted in terms of voicing his opinion, and they weren't even consulting anybody that was that other side was in the front office. They were just doing whatever they wanted to, and a lot of the quotes that came out of this story were there was no sense of direction. They, they lived in fear and just constant 
beratement. Oh my goodness. This sounds absolutely ridiculous. Then with other stories that have come out around this, it's been very, very interesting. The Lakers just seem to kind of keep this runaway train of just drama and what I'm going to term now insanity because I feel like we've upgraded to that point. We're past just it being a crazy story yeah. now. This is a truly insane scenario that is going down in L.A., and I'm sure nobody at this point thought this was going to happen. I'm still calling for it, though. Jeannie Buss needs to sell the franchise. Of course she does. That's the only way out of all of this. It really is. Completely clear house. I mean, you kind of had to know it was coming when she got rid of Mitch Kupchak, who was well-respected, and then got rid of her own brother, who was in yeah. the front office, to bring in Rob Polinka and Magic Johnson. Oh, my goodness. It's absolutely ridiculous. And, of course, Magic does what he does and obviously had his sound-off moment uh, not too long ago. And it just blows my mind that this has been able to devolve to this point where, literally, I feel like control of the franchise is gone nobody has control right now things are just kind of flying left and right whatever sticks to the wall sticks whatever doesn't there's a trash can under you so it's kind of not only like i said insane but it's very shocking i not only what has happened but what could happen yeah and you could tell right away they were talking about uh not only the type of attitude and demeanor that Magic Johnson was putting forth mm-hmm. one of the uh, one of the officials up uh, in the front office said that yeah everybody in the everybody in the public sees the smiling face and the happy attitude but behind the scenes he's very confrontational mm-hmm. he's very I don't make mistakes you can't make it he's very perfectionist but to a fault for right. what it seems Definitely, definitely. And, you know, it's not bad to try and have a perfectionist mentality, especially when you're talking about a professional level of sport where you're bringing guys together to be able to come under who, are, who you're paying millions of dollars to to be able to come together to try and win you a championship and make some type of noise. But now you just have this, a quote-unquote crap show. Yeah, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff going on, and this is just a few of the stories that have been pointed out in here. It's a great read. If you have a chance of 15, 15 20 minutes or so to read it, uh, it's a great read on ESPN.com. But one of the other things I wanted to point out was this just to me was – you were talking about insanity was the great right. word to use. The, one of the guards, Contavious Caldwell Pope, Pope who I mentioned. Poop? Yeah. yeah, Poop. That's basically <laughs> what he plays like, but you right? know, it's a different story. <laughs> That's for a different but, show. Uh, But basically what happened was he went to jail for violating terms of his probation on his DUI case that he had uh, for a while back. They supposedly let him out to practice and play with the team while serving a 25-day jail sentence. He wasn't allowed to leave the state, so he missed maybe four games, but he started nine games in the state of California and was allowed to still travel with the team. But he's supposed to be in jail. One official that was close to the situation pointed out that this was unprecedented, that this even was allowed to happen. Oh, yeah. And most teams just put him on suspension or they just say, hey, go ahead, step away, just serve your time, come back to the team and do your due diligence. Apparently not Magic and Rob Palenka. They said, you know what? No, that's what the judge said. You can do this. So apparently it was some kind of work. Uh, It was like a work release kind of thing where he was allowed to do it. So they said technically they were within the law. Yeah. It's just such a weird turn of events that you never see at any other franchise. Well, maybe they're trying to come up with some type of distraction to kind of distract you from everything else going on. That's possible. You know, because, hey, why not just have somebody get arrested? Because all these other franchises have this. I mean, for years, you had Cincinnati Bengals every single not even year, not even month. Every week, it seemed like a different Cincinnati Bengal was getting seemed arrested. Like and at the end of the day, they're still trotting along perfectly fine. Most stories went under the rug in about four to five weeks. So, you know, maybe that's what they're trying to do. Maybe. maybe. But they never had somebody that was still allowed to play while they were serving a, quote, jail sentence. You know what? Maybe that is highway robbery. The Cincinnati Bengals maybe should have talked to their lawyers a little bit more because maybe. they could have had some guys on, on work release. I mean, Vontae's perfect, maybe? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, that's probably the only one I would have stretched for. It's the only one I can actually remember out of that group, honestly. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Some of them didn't mean anything because after they got arrested, they kind of got shipped out. <laughs> but uh, so many other things out of this story just want, they just blow your mind compared to what a normal business, a normal human being would, would kind of approach these situations. Right. From a business standpoint, it's way out in left field to, to, for me. But I got to ask you. You've seen parts of this story. What do you make of this story? Oh, my god! You've gosh. kind of already touched on it. 
What do you make out of this? Uh, honestly, I feel like it, it's just ever devolving. I, it's now we're getting to the point. I feel like what comes next, kind of thing. And you know, there's going to be something. It's not even like, oh, does this maybe kind of end, and we're kind of just sitting on the edge of our seat waiting for that moment. No, there's going to be a next thing followed by another thing that's going to ultimately always going to lead down to Genie Bus selling the team, and possibly LeBron leaving the Lakers. I'm not going to say L.A., but possibly leaving the Lakers. I mean, it's possible. I would definitely see him leaving the Lakers. I don't know about him going to the Clippers, but hey, it's possible if he wants to stay in L.A. I mean, his kid, his kid is going to an academy there in, in Los Angeles now. Oh yeah, um, and, and he's established that he really likes being in the L.A. area. So definitely, uh, for me, what I see out of this is kind of just reiterating what I've been saying and pounding the table with the last few weeks, just saying that the. Magic Johnson aura that everybody sees uh, around the league is is just a facade. Right. It's just a facade. He's not he's not exactly the best person to work with. Clearly. No, uh, definitely but, not. But I think this is just going to keep getting worse and worse for the LA Lakers, and ultimately, yeah, it's going to have to come down to like you said, Jeannie Buss is going to have to try to sell this team or do something to try to change the culture. If that means getting rid of Rob Polenka, oh yeah, now Magic's already gone. Just clean house and start all over. So be it. But the, the big question I always feel like is it with or without LeBron? Because at the end of the day, you can still build something around LeBron. That even when LeBron decides to step away and retire, which we know eventually will happen, that hey, maybe we might have a nice nucleus here. However, I'm of the opinion that because of the ragtag group they've had assemble this roster, that's not going to be the case. And I feel like literally. Cut it all out, throw it to the side, start fresh. I agree. I think that's what they should do. Um, LeBron's obviously not going to be around for too much longer. He's mm-hmm. in his late 30s, so uh, probably going to retire in a couple of years. But I don't even know if he finishes out his contract in L.A. I don't either. But uh, that is going to be something in the future that we're going to have to address for sure. And I can't wait to keep seeing what happens out of this unfolding story. Well, I think the next big question, though, with it, is does it happen before or after the next season starts? Ooh, that's a good question. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. a very good question. I, I have my moments. I think, <laughs> yeah, you do. You do have your moments. <laughs> it, I mean, minus all that. But, uh, but yeah, I think it happens in the middle of next season. Ooh, that's even more dangerous. I don't even think it happens be- at, the, at the beginning of this season because they're going to try to f- put together whatever they can and then try to run through the first month or two of the season, see what happens. I think once you get around the trade deadline, that's where you're going to start seeing a lot of things just fall apart. And then I think at the end of the year, LeBron's probably gone. Whether he, oh, yeah. whether he opts out, uh, I think he can opt out after the second year, if I'm not mistaken. I think you're right. Um, or they trade him or something. I mean, that's unprecedented in and of itself. But if you run the Lakers, you might have to think about it. Definitely, definitely. That's very interesting. Honestly, I think I could see, depending upon how events may unfold, it could happen right before the season. But if it weren't to happen then, definitely in midseason. But I feel like if it happens then, like you're going to see just an utter implosion of the team from top to bottom. And they, they might barely be fielding a team come that part of the season. So I agree. I, think, I don't think anybody really is lining up to play with LeBron anymore like they were no, when no. he was in Miami, uh, which that's been a, a common... I wouldn't say theme, but it's more of a theory right now that a lot of players don't really want to play with him anymore. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those players that did want to play are now retired. And at the end of the day, when you see a lot of these younger players that are now coming into their own that are able really to go out there and just ball all day, don't really look at a guy like LeBron like a need. I don't need to play with you. And I think that's the mentality a lot are taking because LeBron honestly is not the player he used to be. He's still good. I'll give him that. But... He's not what he used to be. And like we have said earlier, he is on the backside of 30. So retirement is going to be coming up. So all that in mind, most players are really just trying to assert themselves rather than try and play with LeBron. These aren't the big three days. You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. exactly. So at the end of the day, though, we do need to give a really large round of applause. Yeah. (laughs) Round of applause. Baxter Holmes. Yes. Getting that story out there, buddy. So it's really weird the fact that this story came out on ESPN because you know how Historically, they don't like to put scathing stories about their key franchises oh, no. like the New Yorks or the Dallas's. Uh, I mean, even to an extent in the NFL, Dallas. But it's just really interesting that the senior writer for ESPN basically said, you know what? I've been compiling this story for years now, 
it's got to go out, and they give the green light. And that's now I know they've been trying to sprinkle this into their sports center shows, but uh, it's been really interesting because the dynamic with how they're friendly with Magic Johnson Mm -hmm. in this story is the complete opposite of what they show in front of the camera. So it'll be really interesting to see if Magic calls out Baxter Holmes for some of these things that come out. But when you've got handfuls of people that have worked under this organization that are all corroborating these stories and these rumors, Mm -hmm. at some point, Magic can't sweep this under the rug and just put a smiling face anymore. No, you really can't. You know, once you see all the things that are happening in the underlying of the actual franchise, you're, you're going to want to distance yourself. And at first, we thought this was Magic just being a quitter. And honestly, we're starting to learn that it's a lot more than just him being a quitter. Because we've seen how Magic was as a coach and with other standings. But now this is starting to make a little bit more sense, at least from his standpoint. Yeah, it does make a little bit more sense from Magic's standpoint. But to me, I'm still seeing it as... When you create that kind of a culture, don't be surprised when it comes back around full mm-hmm, circle that's true. and bites you bites you in the ass. That is true. Which I think is exactly what happened. That is very true. But talking about things that could possibly end up biting you in the ass, we need to talk about the uh, ever-growing dumpster fire known as the Houston Rockets. This is insane. I just I haven't been able to see this coming for, for a while. I mean, you would think that, okay, they're just going to reload. They'll get ready for next year. And that'll be it. But this is definitely not the case. This has just come up while we were getting ready for the show over the mm-hmm. last couple of days. Uh, this story broke. And uh, basically what what came down to is the Rockets GM, Daryl Morey, uh, said that, quote, every player is available. That's so crazy to me. Every player is available. Including 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 their, their staple, James Harden. Including James Harden. Oh, well, my now, goodness. That's pretty far-fetched that he could actually be available because of his style of play and not a lot of teams like the way that he plays. It's not really conducive to championship basketball. True, But it's really more so how are you going to, if you even find someone to want him, you can't get rid of his 30, $38 million contract he's got this year. And not that he's, easy. He's got, I think 170 million left on his contract. Mm. And then you got Chris Paul, who's now also on the block. 34 years old, but he's got three years and $124 million left on his deal. There's no team that's going to conceivably want to take on that kind of money for a guy who's barely on the floor, really. He's always hurt now. Yeah, it does seem like he's always hurt, but hey, it's because he's 34 years old. The guy's getting older. And when you get these players that are getting older that you end up trying to put a lot of minutes on, they end up breaking and wearing down quicker. It's just how it works. But... Like you said, Chris Paul's getting paid a stupid amount of money. I think you might have a hard time finding someone picking that to pick that up, especially only for well, three years. That's not too bad, but I mean, we're talking about Chris Paul. He's thirty-four years old. Yeah, and you got to imagine how much mileage does he realistically have in full seasons? I mean, judging yep. by judging by what he's been doing in Houston the last few years, he hasn't been healthy for a full season. His whole tenure, I don't believe. Well, the thing is, too, is that he's not even the premier player there, and he's still getting injured. But he's still the highest paid player on the roster. Funny how that works. It's it's weird. It's weird. But uh, other players that expect to be on the move this offseason, Clint Capella, who they just signed him to that massive deal not too long ago. He's making almost $15 million a year. Uh, Eric Gordon, who is – he just – he just turned 30 this past year. He's got roughly $14 million on his cap as well uh, as far as cap space is concerned. So those guys, I could see them getting moved uh, to some team that wants another piece to Definitely. try to push them over the top. But other than that, I mean, you're kind of stuck, in my opinion, with this roster if you're the Rockets. Yeah, and that's really crazy to think about. But even on top of that... There's another big piece of this whole puzzle, I think, that's really going to be really telling with how a lot of this is going to work out. What do you think that is? I agree, Ed. you got to be talking about head coach Mike D'Antoni here. Uh, rec- I am. Recently, in the last few <laughs> days, uh, he has apparently ended contract negotiations for an extension with management, uh, but he does plan to complete the final year of his deal this upcoming season. But a lot of rumors have been swirling about why this might be happening or maybe he just kind of balked at the contract that he was offered by the by management. But uh, his his uh, agent, Warren Laguerre, uh, stated that he wanted to clear things up. 
Apparently, from what he said, quote, the reported $5 million is really $2.5 million because it comes with contingencies. One, uh, it's only $5 million if he makes the playoffs, and two, if he's actually coaching the team by the end of the year, end quote. So if he even gets they have they struggle out the gate, they fire him, he's still going to get $2.5 million. Oh, yeah. But he obviously was making 4 and a half this last year. He wants to make, obviously, more than that. Well, definitely. But... This is really an interesting turn, and especially with the GM saying that everybody is on the block and available, what's going to happen with this head coach? So are they going to have to essentially clear everybody because of the fact that D'Antoni's leaving and half your players are going to be gone by the end of the year as well? It's a complete culture change, and that's going to be a really big this is a big pivotal offseason for the Houston Rockets it most definitely is from every type of angle and I feel like maybe there's even a small amount of planning waiting game to where maybe winning is not going to be their top priority going into this next season just because of the fact you're gonna have a lot of players that are going to be a little bit disgruntled they already know their head coach is going to be leaving uh you know there's going to be a massive roster turnover that's going to be coming up after the season if not even before that end of the season so it's definitely going to be very interesting to see how all this is going to play out but looking at this where do you think they go from here? Well, if I'm the GM of the Rockets, it's a really tough situation first and foremost because, like we said, you're kind of stuck with Chris Paul. You're stuck with James Harden. You're going to have to make those two work it out because nobody's going to want to take. But those two players take up over 60% of the team's cap space. Oh, yes, most definitely. So you're kind of stuck with just plug-and-play pieces outside of that. Um, I would think they, they're going to have to trade guys like – P.J. Tucker, Eric Gordon, uh, aging veterans that, you know, or maybe they maybe they turn around and trade Clint Capella, who's 25 years old. Maybe there's a team that really wants that kind of a center to help push them over the top. But you've got to make some kind of moves here. But if you got to make a decision one way or the other. Oh, yeah. If you want to blow this team up, don't wait. Blow it up now. Or you're going to have to wait till next season and maybe hope that D'Antoni comes back or – Whatever the case may be. It's a really difficult decision, though, if you are in the front office of the Houston Rockets right now. Oh, absolutely. But I feel like with with the with D'Antoni, I feel like he's going to be gone. I don't think they're going to be able to work anything out. And with that precedent set, I think players are kind of kind of give up. And I think as a GM, you need to kind of realize that maybe this is just going to be a crap year because now you're going to go, this is going to be a transition year of sorts, transitioning out of a new regime. Because then the following season is going to be transitioning into your new regime. But looking at it, like you said, there's a lot of players they could move, but I feel like no matter what, you have to move either Chris Paul or James Harden to try and free up enough space to try and bring in something that's going to be worth. And honestly, if you were to trade either of those two, maybe not so much Chris Paul, but definitely James Harden because of the type of production he had last season, there will definitely be a team that would take him on. It's just finding the right fit, and not just the right fit, but enough compensation that it's going to be worth it for you to be able to build towards that brighter future. Right, I completely agree. This is going to have to be something they're going to have to do. But uh, if if really what they want to do, you're going to probably be stuck with this roster and this coaching staff this year. So this is basically going to be one year. Let's just make one last run at it, see what happens, and try to maybe make a trade at the trade deadline if, if something comes available. But honestly, if you're the Rockets, you have to sit and wait until next offseason to make anything happen. Absolutely. So we'll have to see what happens going for going forward with them. Yeah, we'll definitely see what happens, but also make sure that you stick to the pulse of final score. As you know, as things unfold, that we will most definitely be reporting upon it. But switching a little bit of gears now, we're going to take a look at our NBA playoffs, at our NBA now finals. We're finally to the finals. And you know what? I got to pat myself on the back really, really hard. Because I called it right that the Toronto Raptors were going to make it all the way to the NBA Finals. You doubted me. You did. I did. But we the North. Just remember, who's got the series called ah. right now? Ah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, but you know what? You know what? Just because your team that you picked to win it all is there doesn't mean that my, my team in the North still can't make things happen. But correct me if I'm wrong, though. Did you have, didn't you have the Raptors losing in uh, this round to the... Uh, uh, Houston Rockets, who are now in complete shambles. There's baseball going on behind me. Nobody cares about college baseball right now. We're talking. So about at the game. end of the day, <laughs> yes, yes, I did pick the Toronto Raptors to lose to the Houston Rockets. Way to jump off the bandwagon, Drake. What are you talking about? 
<laughs> what are you talking about? It got cold on that bandwagon, okay? It's really cold in Canada. All right? We've got to keep that in mind here. It is very cold in Canada. Safety first, then teamwork. All right? So, that being said, <laughs> now that Houston's not there, I cannot jump on the ultimate bandwagon known as the Golden State Warriors. So, with that, I realign back to the east and pick the Toronto Raptors to win this. Still six games. Still six games. Still six games. I mean, it, based on game one, what we saw, that this game looks like it could be the Toronto's Raptors series to lose. It absolutely could. I mean, could. winning by nine at home, and not only is your first ever NBA Finals game and winning in your first game, the track records, history shows, were not in Toronto's favor. They had never won a game one of a, of a series yeah. that they've been in. Yeah, until now. The Warriors played so well in game ones under Steve Kerr. I think only losing maybe one game one. Maybe. Maybe one. Maybe one. Maybe one game one. Maybe one game one. But Toronto, give them a lot of credit. They came out and they looked great in the first game. Pascal Siakam, one of your boys. My boy. One of your boys. Couldn't pronounce your name at the beginning of the season. <laughs> I Just love saying. That quiz. It worked out well for you. We got to bring that back sometime. But anyways. I'll bring one back. I'll bring one back. <laughs> yeah. I'll get Baseball you too. Baseball edition. You're screwed. <laughs> Sorry, I'll just bring out hockey and we'll see how well we do. That's true. We'll probably both fail that one. Probably. But uh, Pascal Siakam, 32 points and eight rebounds in this game. He shot 82% from the floor. 82%. 82% from the floor. That, that has to be a record. He couldn't be stopped. No, he couldn't. But I think a lot of that is due to the fact that Golden State was playing a little bit looser from what I saw. They weren't quite as tight on defense like I've normally seen them in past series. So I wonder if maybe they find a way to rotate that back around. Well, you know they're always going to be making adjustments in game two because, I mean, if you're Golden State, on a, on a series like this when you're starting off on the road, you're hoping to just split. Whether it's game one or game two, you're mm-hmm. hoping to split so you can shift that momentum back to you for your home court advantage. No, most but definitely. If you're going by chalk, of course, Toronto should win the first two games at home. And, and go should. from there. They should. should. But uh, we'll see how they respond. Boogie Gussins played for the first time in a couple of rounds. Yeah, that was uh, kind of interesting. Warriors. So he he looked really well even after tearing his quad. Well, that we also had some interesting info that they might have Kevin Durant back for as soon as game four. Maybe game four. Maybe I game I four. I think he plays this round. I mean, honestly, in, I in, in my he's... opinion, I feel like he's already done for the season. But you never know. And honestly, if it came down to it and they needed something to try and lean on, maybe the type of emotional boost having Kevin Durant on the floor could be enough to try and help propel them. Yeah, it's very possible. Uh, They're going to have to play a lot better, though. Uh, They did not necessarily play too well in this game at all. Uh, You got Klay Thompson, who, yeah, he scored 21 points, but his plus minus was negative 10 Mm -hmm. in this game, Uh, not playing very well uh, from the field. But we'll definitely find out a lot more once we get to Game 2 in Toronto, which will be tomorrow, June 2nd, 8 p.m. on ABC. We always know that's always going to be a very telling game at the end of the day. Yeah, definitely. It's it's going to be an exciting game. Can't wait to see the energy. The one thing that we haven't talked about, haven't put in this in this show outline, is the energy that Toronto has brought. In yes. this, this series has been nothing short of amazing. Well, they're getting and it all from Drake. Their, uh, their fan base... <laughs> That's yeah, fine. Drake. Good. Drake definitely uh, brought brings an extra, uh, extra X factor in, when it comes to the crowd. Oh, he, he does. Had, had traded some words with uh, Draymond Green oh. in the game one too. Oh, that was quite funny to watch, and even he had a little bit of John with Steph Curry at one point too. So it's really funny because I I thought it was hilarious that he was wearing Del Curry's Raptors jersey, but then he had a armband covering up the two tattoos that he had. That, that I think read Steph what? Curry and, 30 and 35, yeah, I think Steph it was. Curry and, and uh, Kevin Durant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wearing that so he doesn't seem like he's a total traitor. <laughs> Call me the bandwagoner. I thought it was hilarious. Go magic. But, uh, but yeah, I can't wait for game two on Sunday on ABC. It's going to be 8 o'clock. And then, depending on if maybe it's evened up, home court advantage goes back to the O, the Oracle Arena. They uh, could. Or... The, uh, the, the Raptors could find themselves in unprecedented territory up 2-0 in, in a first-ever finals. Golden State could be looking down the barrel of 0-2, going back home, and potentially they're going to have to play really, really well on Wednesday for Game 3 to avoid 0-3. They definitely will, but position honestly... they've never been in. No, they've never been in this type of position, but I feel like Toronto will win these, this next one at home. 
They have that energy. It's very hard to match. And the North is ready for this. However, when they get back to Oakland, back to the Golden State, and start playing game three and four, I think that's when Steph Curry will start coming on more. They'll be able to feed off of their crowd, be able to get themselves in their home court advantage to be able to take games three and four. However, I feel Toronto will win the next two and win this in Oakland to give that little bit of sting. I thought you said you're gonna, they were going to win six. That is six. Game six is in Golden State. You wrote it yourself. Can't blame me. <laughs> that's a, that's what the networks wrote. Yes. So, you know, it's in game six in Oakland. Oh, I thought you were saying they were going to sweep in, in Oakland. No, 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 oh, no, no. Okay. no. Nothing like that. More clearly. Sorry. No, no, no. More clearly. Sorry. Win the first two, lose the next two, <laughs> then win the next two. There you go. Yeah, that's not confusing at all. That's not confusing. Two, but, two, and two. <laughs> that's how it works. So I, if you're the if you're the Warriors, you've really got to hope that Draymond Green steps up and plays a lot better than he has been playing. Uh, he did have he did have a triple double in the first game, but he only scored ten points. He shot two of nine from the floor. Mm-hmm. Did not look very good. Uh, they need other guys to step up along with Draymond. The guys off the bench, Warriors bench has been scoring over thirty points. In each of the last five playoff games, they need that con- to continue oh, if definitely. they really want a chance at evening the series going back to Oakland for game three. They definitely will, but we'll definitely see how it all plays out. I expect this to be a very exciting series. Nobody expected Toronto to take game one. Just with the history of their game ones in general in the playoffs, and obviously given the recent track record of Golden State, nobody expected this. However, this is what's going to make it an exciting series. And we'll definitely find out more tomorrow, June 2nd, at 8 p.m. on ABC. So definitely make sure that you tune in and enjoy that game because I know I'm going to be watching it. But taking a look at another final our yeah, NHL, yeah, our NHL Stanley Cup final between the Boston Bruins and the St. Louis Blues. Whoever thought we were going to say those two names? Well, in nobody, the finals this year, nobody in what was it, forty nine years, ever thought they would see the St. Louis Blues make it back to the Stanley Cup final. Yet here they are, and not only are they in the final, they finally won their first appearance. They won their first game. In the Stanley Cup final ever. They previously mm. been 0 of 13 and they won a 3 2 thriller in Boston, game two. Oh, yeah, it was absolutely exciting when obviously all the way down to the wire, you end up in OT. But it's really great to see the St. Louis Blues actually do it, seeing how they were previously 0 and 13 in the Stanley Cup final. So, way to go, St. Louis Blues. You got your first win ever. Now, let's see if you can make more magic happen. Maybe knock off the Boston Bruins because <laughs> who likes those guys? Not, I don't. I, I don't either. Oh, okay. For the record. For the record. But For the still, record, your teams are all over the place. I, I'm actually mostly like all Detroit. So. Well, sorry. I like to be culturally <laughs> diversive and include all great parts of this country. This is stuff I got to put up with, I swear. But at the end of the day, though, they did split the regular season 1-1. So it's very fitting that they are now tied in the series 1-1. So we'll definitely see how it works out. But the score differential is so close. So close. So you look at it. The Bruins have only scored six goals. The Blues have scored five. And I really do expect this trend to really continue throughout this playoff where it's really just going to be to the wire, game in and game out. But at the end of the day, who do you have taking this one? Well, I mentioned in last in last week's episode, we talked about what to expect out of this final. And this could have gone one of two ways. Boston could have just come through and been a buzzsaw and just take four games in a row. Definitely. Which is what a lot of people were expecting. But as I mentioned, watch out for St. Louis. They play physical. Yes, they played in a lot of extended series as far as their past rounds. But I would not be surprised if they make this a six or seven game series. However, I do see the Boston Bruins hoisting Lord Stanley's Cup at the, end of, at the end of the series. I really hope that doesn't happen. I'd like to see the St. Louis Blues actually kind of make kind of make a role and maybe have something happen, but uh, it's definitely going to be interesting. I see this going down where the Blues could actually take this, but I think it would end up taking them all seven games. My only worry is I don't know if they have the physicality to really match up with Boston to last out seven games. So sadly... Sadly, I do see Boston winning this in six, but I'd like to see St. Louis make me eat my words, and I've done that a lot already this year. So I really hope you guys can line up and be the next team to do it. That way I can see you guys host, or hoist, sorry. Hoist it. My words are all over the place. Hoist. 
I mean, Lord we are Stanley's hosting Cup. draft day, but we're we not, are hosting draft day. But we're not hoisting anything. I mean, I can find some kind of trophy around here possibly to hoist, but you're hoisting one right now. Oh uh, yes, it's a beautiful one. Uh. <laughs> but uh, but game three is actually going on right now. Right now. Right now. Actually, and just a few minutes well, we were hoping it was going to be behind us, but we ended up with NHL countdown with Wayne Gretzky currently on. But yeah, we're, we're tied zero zero in the first period right now. Yeah. Uh, so currently. So, yeah. So plenty of time left to go. Make sure you definitely check it out after draft day, of course. And uh, it's going on right now on NBC or yes, on NBC uh, Sports Network. So definitely make sure you go check it out. It's a great game. But obviously, you want to stay here as we host. Not hoist, host the draft host, day. Yes, not hoist. Not hoist. If I hoist draft day, I, I might hurt my oh, back. Oh, did it turn back on behind us? There it is. There it is. So, at the end of the day, definitely going to be a great series. Definitely make sure you check out that next game. But, uh, breaking a little bit of a sweat, we got to change gears to another sport. It's a lot of gear changing. A lot of gear changing. I'm looking like I'm a guy who's a race car driver. <laughs> no NASCAR references here, please. So, getting to our Major League Baseball best of the week. Tell you what, this is going to be a good one because... This one sets record precedent because we're going to start out with mine because I don't care about yours. Mine's bigger than yours. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you oh, I'm a, sorry. You took a cop-out answer and you went with a very broad best of the week. Well, I found both of ours, so it's okay. So at the end of the day, <laughs> that's, that's true. There was a, a record set in home runs in a month. So for Major League Baseball, the record now sits at 1,000. 135 home runs in the month of May, setting the all-time any-month record for Major League Baseball. Now, why this is significant is because we have been seeing an uptick in home runs being able to be hit, guys that really are able to go yard and knock it clear over the fence. And what was crazy about it is going into the last day, which was May 31st, Friday, yesterday, we hit it from every angle in case you can't remember what day that was, we needed 25 home runs to break the record. Now, that seemed like a tall order. There were a bunch of games going on, but 25 home runs seemed kind of steep. We had 40 hit. Wow, 40? 40 home runs in one day. And what's funny, and you're going to love this one because you like to bring this guy up a lot, Toronto's Vladimir Guerrero Jr. I do. Went deep in the eighth inning against Colorado to set the record with 1,120 home runs. And that officially broke the record. Now, if you're any good at math, which I, I tend to be, so I'll do it for you, they ended up hitting another 15 home runs throughout that day on top of that. That's just mind-boggling. Mind bo- I can't even get the words out. It's so crazy. <laughs> that is a very, it's a very a, a big feat for, for everyone in Major League Baseball, uh, and especially in this day and age when you're trying to find – Major League Baseball is trying to find ways to keep viewers' eyes glued to the television oh, yeah. and helping speed up the game and mm-hmm. try to encourage more – uh, more people to tune in or even go to the games. Uh, yep. This is a really big thing for the MLB to hang its hat on. It's not just a pitching duel all the time like it was last year. Uh, the pitchers oh, yeah. dominated quite a bit. Definitely. Uh, so the, this is really good from a marketing standpoint for for Major League Baseball. So well, that's, a, them. Well, that's a big thing when you have these kind of sports that aren't necessarily high scoring type of sports. To be able to have this type of offensive production is really going to help polarize it to bring people in. And that's going to be the great thing for Major League Baseball. But to rattle off some stats, because you know how much I love my stats. Oh, you love your stats. Oh, I love my stats. For better or for worse. For better or for worse. Man, I don't know. Don't tell my wife that. But anyways, <laughs> if we're looking at it. Pittsburgh's John Bell, Houston's Alex Bregman, and Cincinnati's Derek Dietrich led the way with 10, 12 home runs each in the month of May. Topping everybody. All players. Now, if you look at it from a team aspect, three teams hit at least... 50 home runs in May. Three. Not one, not two. Three. Counting I feel, lessons. I feel like that's the first time that's ever happened. I think it is the first time it's ever happened that three teams have been able to hit that mark in the same month with the Minnesota Twins hitting 56 home runs, the Chicago Cubs hitting 51 home runs, and, hey, the Boston Red Sox hitting 51 home runs. What, what happened to them? They were struggling. I, I guess we're smacking balls <laughs> now, buddy. <laughs> but looking further down at it, the Twins only fell two sh- two runs shy of matching their record of 58 homers in a month shared by the 1987 Orioles and the 1999 Seattle Mariners. Those were two great teams. Two, two amazing teams. Those two teams were amazing. Very amazing. And on top of that, with a 2,279 homers that were hit on the year after Friday's game, the league is now on pace 
to hit 6,510 home runs, which would easily surpass a single season record of 6,105 that was set only two years ago. Just goes to show you again the uh, the trend of, of hitting that Major League Baseball has been encouraging over the last few years. They're trying to speed up the game so pitchers can't take nearly as long as far as between pitches and everything like that. So less preparation as far as slowing and kind of getting into the minds of hitters. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, this is I think this is a good trend for Major League Baseball to Absolutely. Again, try to get more viewers and pull them in. Uh, to watch more games and to attend more games. Yeah, especially if they want to try and take back the crown of America's sport. Having something like this is really, in a manner of speaking, a godsend for them. Yeah, they're never going to get that back. No, they're not. It belongs to football now. <laughs> Thank you, Major League Baseball, I mean, even for giving they, it a hard even try. Even if they wanted to, you couldn't get past the top three or four. I mean, you got, you got American football. Uh, basketball, I guess, could be a second. NASCAR is probably third. And, and it's still making headway. They're always trying to find ways to uh, expand, <laughs> especially now with their uh, their mass diversity programs. Yeah, so I don't think Major League Baseball is going to unseat that uh, America's America's sport anymore. But Woo, go football. Still, they could still be America's pastime, I guess. But Yeah, they could hold on to that moniker. Yeah, That's they cute. Can they can keep it. But looking at best of the week, what do you have on tap for us? So I'm actually using an example from one of – the players that you mentioned in your best of the week. So my best of the week is first baseman of the Pittsburgh Pirates, Josh Bell. So while he was hitting 15 home runs in the month of May, uh, he actually set his own record, 94 total bases in, in the month of May, which is the most since Willie Mays in 1958. And it's the most by any player in any month in the Pittsburgh Pirates' 138-year history. That is insane. So just to give you an idea of the type of season he's having, in 56 games this year, he's hitting 343, which is, I think, top three in the NL right now. Oh, yeah. So he's swinging the bat very well. He's got a on-base percentage of uh, 405. He's, he's uh, scored 42 runs, had 74 hits, 20 doubles, two triples, 18 home runs, and 52 RBIs. He's off to a great start. Off to a, he's off to a great start this year uh, in Major League Baseball. So let's we'll see what uh, what he has in store for the next month in June because his play is helping keep the Pittsburgh Pirates in kind of the run for the NL Central right now. I mean they're still right around 500, but he's keeping them in in the conversation. Yeah, definitely, and it's definitely been interesting, especially because the Pittsburgh Pirates kind of were becoming a story last year where they are trying to build themselves up a little bit and kind of fell short at the end. So it's definitely nice to have Josh Bell come out and be one of those real big uh, bell cows for them and really try and do it great. So we'll definitely see how that plays out, but that has been your Major League Baseball best of the week, and it's definitely going to be exciting because uh, even though we're getting ready to go to a little bit of a commercial break here in just a moment, we have something we're going to do real quick. Oh, we got a surprise. First surprise of the night. What first surprise of the night is we're doing a prize giveaway. Prize giveaway? That's right. Because Wait, what are we giving away? Well, the first one we're going to be giving away is this nice University of South Florida Bulls fan jersey, number 14. This is a little bit older, but this is a nice fan favorite if you are a USF Bull. It's not for a child. It, it it's actually like a woman's. It looks like it's for a child. It's actually a, a woman's medium. So if you're a woman and you're a fan, we got you covered. We got a curtail <laughs> to everybody, okay? This is true. We have a lot of... Remember, yeah, diversity. Yeah, we have a lot of strong female fans out there at the show. We do, but it seems how... It looks like we have this nice fan right here. looks like he wants it. There you go, little boy. <laughs> See, I told you. See, I told you. That's a, that's Wait, a child. Why, why is there a little boy here? Someone needs to get this security. guy out of here. Security. <laughs> security. And why, why, are you, why are you throwing it to that? Never mind. Anyways... Anyways, anyway, giving away stuff left and right around here at Final Score. You know, that's what we try to do. We try to try to give back to the fans in any way we can, even if it happens to be some type of child who somehow miraculously appeared in this establishment. I mean, there's a there's a kid up there. That's like a baby at the bar up there. Yeah, I feel like that's okay, then it should then See? it should be okay. See? You know what? Let's go give them that jersey. We're in Deland, okay? The rules don't apply over here. Did you say D Land? No, I said Deland. D Land. Oh, okay, sorry, D Land. D Land. So, anyways, though. This has been such a wonderful time, but we do have to take a quick commercial break. But make sure you stay tuned because when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit of NFL. We're finally going to bust out another little surprise. 
But before all that, we'll be bringing in our draft day segment. Bringing in the beer guy. That's right. We're going to bring in Derek the beer guy. who's going to have a whole list of great brews that we're going to taste test, and then we're going to make our draft day pick of the month. I'm excited. It's our first time doing this. This is great. I'm, well, I'm I mean, well, it's your first time. First it's like my 387th. I, I've lost count. Anyways, but anyways, make sure you stay tuned. We'll be right back. It's going to be amazing. See you in a bit. The following support and sponsor, Podcast City Network. City Limits Tap Room, Sports Bar in the Land, Florida has brew on tap, serve food, the grilled cheese is excellent. For upcoming events check out City Limits Tap Room on Facebook.com slash City Limits Tap Room. Atlantic Sounds has thousands of new and used vinyl records and CDs. If they don't have it they can order it for you. Same location since 1982. For more updates on what's new check out Atlantic Sounds on Facebook.com slash Atlantic Sounds Vinyl. Sports Sanity Customs have worked with organizations from custom embroidering polo shirts to jerseys for your kids' baseball team. They do it all. Armed with state-of-the-art equipment and an in-house design team, they are equipped to take on your next project. Visit their website to learn more, sportsanitycustoms.com. Visit Sports Sanity Customs on Facebook.com slash Sports Sanity Customs. Three Count Design offers a wide range of graphic design products, video, photography and other forms of media. Everything from t-shirt designs to websites. Visit Facebook.com slash Three Count Design for more. Demo Blast Studios, an explosion of imagination. Original artwork, podcasts, video, apparel and more. Visit DemoBlastStudios.com. Visit Demo Blast Studios on Facebook.com slash Blast Studios, the best family entertainment pro wrestling show in the state of Kentucky. Kentucky's own wrestling brings quality family event to wrestling to a town near you. Kentucky's own wrestling offers a ladies division in wrestling and a training school. Kentucky's own wrestling is the current longest running southern promotion. Visit Facebook.com slash Somerset Kentucky's own wrestling. All supporters and sponsors are brought to you by Podcast City Network. And we are back here on Final Score as part of Draft Day here at City Limits Tap Room. Man, I had a little carnage come out there. I, I hear that. You Every time you do that, it makes me sound like I'm in the movie The Shining. Yeah. And they're like, I'm Here's on the other side. Johnny? Yeah, that's pretty much what it sounds like. I mean, I could post my head through something, but I kind of left those days behind <laughs> there's, me there's when I used right to wrestle. There. Hey, look, what? <laughs> Anyways, but we are back here for draft day as part of final score. And I tell you what, I'm having a great time. You having a good time? Oh, it's been a great time. Uh, City Limits Tap Room has been a, such a gracious host for us. Definitely. Um, they've, they've been fantastic. Uh, if you've never been out in uh, D-Land, Florida, D-Land. it's actually out here uh, just north of Orlando. And it's, yep. it's, a, it's a very nice setup. We've got some, we've got some uh, pool tables in the back. We've got some dartboards. Uh, there's plenty of beers on tap. Oh, TVs plenty. all over the place. Uh, but it's 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 a great venue. I'm excited to be here. Definitely. So definitely make sure you come and check it out at 2620 North Woodland Boulevard in beautiful D-Land, Florida, which downtown D-Land was voted not one but two-time America's downtown. So definitely make sure you come out to D-Land and check us out here at City Limits. We've got a great venue in the back, outside bar, of course, the full I kitchen. The outside. Yeah, you yeah. can't forget about that. Got some horseshoes you can play. Real great atmosphere. A lot of great fun to be had. So definitely make sure that you come down and check it out at some point. But... Derek, the beer guy, is not here yet. Not here yet. We're waiting on our uh, on our beer. So yes, apparently gonna... apparently he's prepping the beer. Getting ready. Because we were going to kick off with draft day, but we got to wait on that. So while we're waiting, we're going to go ahead. We're going to kick over into a little bit of NFL news. Just means I hope your liver's ready because we're probably going to have to drink a little faster. Woo. So I'm ready. Looking at NFL news. It's definitely been an interesting offseason, which we have covered uh, week in and week out here on Final Score. But there is something sad that happened. Something really sad. And that was a, a injury to a very integral person as part of the Green Bay Packers. And that is head coach Matt LaFleur. Not a player? Oh, no, it wasn't a player. Sorry, oh, just okay, a head coach. Sorry. Yeah, oh, he, tore his, head coach. he tore his Achilles playing basketball, apparently. Well, because you know how hands on he likes to be with his players. So playing a little B ball in the Green Bay Packers well, uh, field younger, house. He is a younger coach, so that is it's kind of a thing that younger coaches have been doing lately, is they're actually playing. 
and being active, whether it's in practice or with their yep. players and doing all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a terrible injury. But Well, yeah, but it's like when we saw, I think it was a video of the uh, Texas Tech linebackers coach, I think it was, who was just going ham in defensive offseason drills, just showing these guys that, look, I'm old and I can do this too and show you guys up. <laughs> so I'm not surprised that Matt LaFleur, he is 39. 39. He's relatively young. As that is coach. relatively young for a coach. Absolutely. Because you look at guys like Bill Belichick, who's pushing, what, 60s, 70s. So at the end of the day, not too shabby. But he did tear his Achilles. They don't know exactly what the timetable will be for recovery yet, as he is set to have surgery tomorrow. So we'll definitely see how that all plays out. But on a much more serious note, because we do like to joke around here on Final Score a lot. But on a serious, serious note, we did lose a great, great legend. And that is former Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame quarterback, Bart Starr. Now, if you're not familiar with Bart Starr, uh, he was drafted out of Alabama to the Green Bay Packers uh, in the 17th round in, in the 1956 draft. Back when they had more than seven rounds. Back, Yeah, back when they had more than seven rounds. But we are going to take a quick pause from, from Bart Starr real quick because Derek yes. the Beer Guy. Derek the Beer Guy is here. Derek the Beer Guy is here. Come join us. Oh, yes. Oh, with our Very first good. beer lined up. Come around, come join us, and uh, tell us about this beer. There you go, sir. Thank Ricky you Bobby. Thank, Thank you. Welcome, welcome Thank to, you. to final score Thank as you. part of draft day. Um, it's been a minute. It definitely has. Last time we did draft day. Yeah, you uh, forgot. You got to speak into the mic. I, I'm trying to not have a big, deep voice. Whoa. Uh, is this uh, good enough? Uh, so it's all right. Put it near the mouth. It's so okay. last time we did this, we were all pretty wasted by this time of the night. Uh, <laughs> yes, we were. And we it try was an to all be a little event. bit professional. This we, time. we try. This time. Yeah. yeah, we try. Final score. We try to be a little professional. Yeah, we, we try to be pro, so so we can at least be respected. Yes, yeah. at but least ish. Uh, but uh, go ahead. So what, what kind of uh, beers you got? This for is Tuker Helles Hefeweizen. It's a Ooh, beer Hefeweizen. out of uh, Germany. Um, it Ooh. is very. Uh, very good. Uh, sessionable. Um, usually you want to have this with a uh, orange in it. We didn't do that given that these are samples. Um, very yeasty smell to it. Mm. You're going to get some citrus very. notes possibly. Uh, some a very crisp everessence. Yes. Uh, with um, good malty light malty character to it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I like I like the German Hefweizens. They're, yeah, yeah. they're very delicious. Oh, very delicious beers. And you can definitely get those citrus German, notes. So that makes sense. Well, yeah. I am too, but you know, yes. we're not we're not going to be crazy today, okay? No. True. Not today. Well, maybe later. No German, guys. No German. <laughs> I was so tempted to scream right now, but I thought better of it. We'll save that for Thank you, fans. Show, the post the post show party. <laughs> Which you can join us at the end of draft day with final score here at 2620 North Woodland Boulevard in beautiful D Land, Florida. But given that this is the Hellas, usually Hellas styles tend to be more of a lager. Um, and the color of the beer is a little bit more lighter and pale, uh, which you can definitely see. Um, now, is it more cloudy because of the citrus? or That's because the typical Hefeweizens tend to be cloudy. Mm, okay. Um, just that it's not filtered, really. And that's a lot of good beers, in my opinion, aren't you know filtered. They don't filter out. They leave it in there. It just adds to the experience and adds to the beer, um, in my personal opinion. But Tuka Hefeweizen or Hellas Hefeweizen. It's very good. Sorry, right, I finished mine. <laughs> I see that. Finishing it with you, sir. Cheers. All right. Cheers. I have another beer, though. I have another beer. And you have another one. So it's okay. You're going to get wasted by the end of this show. I don't know what you're talking about. I never get drunk during draft day with a beard on and <laughs> bright shirts and sunglasses and, and stuff. See, and we're going to see Chris, uh, Chris Carnage. Only if I put the sunglasses on. Hey, guys. And then you'll see Suck a full scale. Hey, fans. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for the first uh, first sample here. Definitely. I look forward to seeing the next one. We'll have Definitely. Next one. All right. You'll get, as he gets there. round two, though, we're going to continue with our uh, NFL news. Ooh, there we go. All right, so getting back to Bart Starr, um, he passed away tragically at 85. Uh, he did have a nice full life. It was really great. But uh, he was drafted out of Alabama in the 17th round of the 1956 draft, which, you know, back then they had, I think it was upwards of 20 different rounds. Yeah, I believe so. And uh, he led the Packers to five straight league titles 
including the first two Super Bowls in Super Bowl One and Super Bowl Two, both of which he was the Super Bowl MVP. In his era, he was one of the considered one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Uh, up there with uh, even this is right around the time of also Johnny Unitas. He yes. actually predates Johnny Unitas a little bit. Yes, he actually uh, did get drafted. I think it was uh, upwards of about eight or so years before Unitas was. Uh, but he was he was the he was the gold standard of quarterbacks. Yes. in the in that time frame. So uh, this is you know they this also during the Lombardi uh, era for coaching and. Uh, they actually just had on NFL Network, just a little off topic, they actually had a documentary about the Lombardi years, and Bart mm-hmm. Starr was included in that, partially as a tribute to him, but uh, really great, really great documentary there. If you get it a really chance was. to see it on NFL Network, it's amazing. But uh, definitely a big, big loss for not only uh, fans of the Green Bay Packers, but just... Just football fans in general. Oh, yes. Especially for what he brought to the table because he did so many great things in a time where being a a big-time passing team wasn't really a thing. And never in a season did he ever surpass 16 touchdowns. Never did he surpass 2,500 passing yards because then it was literally all about the running game. The forward pass wasn't even that old at that point. It was no, the forward pass was only innovated, what, in the 30s or 40s? I think it was in the four, early 40s. I think it was the early 40s by, who was it? Oh, yeah. Notre Dame against Army when we beat them 40 to nothing, one versus two. But anyways, that's and, for another time. Army still doesn't pass the ball. <laughs> no, <laughs> and neither does Navy, and it just passes on to the other service academies. But looking at it, though, he had the highest, Bart Starr, that is, the highest passer rating in the postseason in NFL history at 104.8, which is unprecedented. Really is unprecedented. And he had a 9-1 and postseason record. However, that one was his very first league title game he had ever played in. So he won the next nine, but the very first one he lost to the 1960 Philadelphia Eagles. Fly, Eagles, fly. The only NFL championship the Eagles had until that's the right Super Bowl win. Thank you, Nick Foles. So, at the end of the day, though, Bartar really was an amazing player to the point of being not only a four-time Pro Bowler, uh, he was also the 1966 NFL MVP and was inducted into not only the Green Bay Hall of Fame, but the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1977. Yeah, it's just a big loss for for the NFL community and for football fans alike. So, uh, our condolences go out to Bart Starr's family and... You know, this is unfortunately Father Time wins uh, yet again. But <laughs> but you know uh, what? You, you know what makes these type of moments better? More beer, because <laughs> Derek the beer guy is here with round two, and wow, that continue. has an interesting color. Ooh, I'm I'm very right. intrigued by this, Derek. Come join us again. So uh, this beer is called Flamingo Dreams. It's uh, out of Left Hand Brewing out of Longmont, Colorado. Okay. Uh, they're known for stouts. Uh, this particular one has sure. its foamy head from uh, it being on nitro. Foamy head? Uh, which which is why it has that the head, that beautiful head there. Very oh, okay. beautiful. Um, oh, the jokes I could make. Uh, it's ra- it has like a raspberry Ooh. twist to it, but it is a Belgian blonde. So, it, oh, okay. so it's a, like a raspberry Belgian blonde? Yes. Ooh. Very interesting. Wow, this is really good. Very yeah. tasty. It just it kind of tastes like it kind of tastes like a can you know like Jolly Rancher candy. Kind of, yeah. yeah kind of does. It has that tart sweetness. Like the black yeah. cherry one. And uh, given that it's on nitro, it produces a smoother, a smoother t- uh, body, um, and it's a little full, a little full bodiness to it. Not a, yeah. a more medium, probably medium, but uh, given that's because of the nitro, if this wasn't on nitro, it probably would be a little bit lighter. The lighter right. side. Yeah, it's very good. Very light, very tasty. Let's, Let's cheers. Cheers. Before I drink it all. Yeah, this guy. <laughs> Before this guy drinks it well, all. Well, you know, I have my moments. <laughs> <laughs> Applies to all things, sadly. That is very true. It is almost on the dessert end, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I'd probably only want to drink one or two of these because it is pretty sweet. I feel like it's going to go really good with like cake or like yes. ice cream. Yes. Yeah. Or like a strawberry ice cream float of some kind. Ooh. Yeah, that would be uh, ideas. Really delicious. Ideas. Yeah. We need to trademark these. Out. Yeah, start trademarking those. But um, 
this is a shout out. Uh, I forgot to in the last beer at City Limits. They there there are people that purchase taps for the year. They get to put any beer that they want on tap. Uh, the first beer that we had, the Hellas uh, Hefeweizen, uh, that was by Kirk. He suge- he selected that beer to be on tap. This one is Serena, uh, and she is one of the bartenders here. Uh, she suggested this one after one of the beers, original beers, were not on tap. Yeah, uh, that we wanted tonight. So. Shout out. Uh, if it wasn't for some of the patrons that come here frequently, we wouldn't have these amazing beers here. Yeah, it's a very interesting promotion, too, buying a tap and yes. then being able to put whatever beer you like and get on a that tap. Free that's beer awesome. every time you come up here. Yeah, one, one a, day. a day. One beer a day. That's that's really yeah. cool. Uh, it's a really cool promotion. Are you thinking about getting in on it as, as part of the D Land experience? I mean, I might. You never know. <laughs> We're always crazy here at Final Score. You never know what we'll do. <laughs> Blame it on the alcohol. <laughs> always blame it on, always blame it on the alcohol. But uh, all, right. all right, thank you so much. Thank Derek. you so much. Uh, we're gonna, thank you, gentlemen. We're gonna finish this one here, and we'll wait number three. And we got some more NFL news you wanted to get to, correct? We do, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm getting looser by the minute. Uh, so <laughs> to continue with our NFL news, uh, safety Earl Thomas apparently has been turning heads at OTAs. Uh, To the point that uh, there's a few comments made about it. Now, if you don't remember, Earl Thomas used to play for the uh, Seattle Seahawks. He ended up fracturing his leg September 30th of last year against the Arizona Cardinals in that game. That was a crazy one that the Seahawks had to pull out in game four of last season. Now, with that, though, in the offseason, he did sign a four-year, $55 million contract with the Baltimore Ravens, not having proved that this leg was going to be ready to go whatsoever. However, he has come out and wowed everybody looking, quote, fluid, clean, and playing with no restraint. Big that's, words to hear. That's some pretty high praise, uh, especially coming from the coaching staff with that gruesome of an injury. I remember uh, having watched that live, it looked pretty bad. You, oh, yeah. you knew that you had a feeling that maybe his career might even be over based on how ugly it looked when it came when it happened. So it's, it's really good news for Earl Thomas, not only for him, personally, but also for the team as well, because the, the Ravens took a, a bit of a leap of faith here to sign him a big leap to, of that, faith. to that four-year $55 million deal. Uh, so that's you know that's definitely some good signs for them. They definitely need to re, essentially retool that, uh, that defense of theirs, and high praise from Coach Harbaugh as well, saying that you, he, saying, quote, he had a great week. Uh, this was after Thursday's practice. Uh, said he had great anticipation, great ability to cover ground. He shows up in the right spots on a regular basis. That's what great safeties do. He's done a great job, end quote. So exciting news for him to to know that he can still be out there and play at the high level that everyone knows he's capable of doing. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see how he looks further into the offseason, getting into the preseason, uh, and then also getting that in that regular season schedule oh, yeah. as well. It's going to be grueling, but I think as he gets a little bit more healthy every day, he's going to look a little bit better. That Ravens defense could look scary if he's fully healthy this year. That, and considering the uh, great history that that Ravens defense usually has, having such a great playmaker like Earl Thomas coming over from the Legion of Boom to really slot in and be that new safety uh, of the immediate future anyways for the Baltimore Ravens, I think really helps bring back that type of of hard-nosed defense that the Baltimore Ravens have always been known for. So I'm really excited to see how this is going to play out, especially with the other pieces they were able to bring in. So definitely going to be an exciting time to be a Ravens fan this upcoming season. I definitely agree. Uh, and that's, that's it for the NFL news we've got. Sadly, we did not have a lot, to, a lot today. A lot. Actually, I do have one more I can pull out of my butt right now, and this is a true story. So oh, I can't wait to hear this. I, I said it. Apparently, there have been reports that quarterback Daniel Jones has taken on a lot of early season mannerisms of Eli Manning that he took early on in his career. So apparently Giants brass are taking this as a good sign that Daniel Jones might just follow in the footsteps of Eli Manning. I'm pretty sure we talked about this when they drafted him, right? Because he, even in the first weeks of his rookie OTAs, and oh, they were talking about the how picture. He, he, he looks, he sounds, and he acts exactly like Eli Manning. He's like a clone. Mm-hmm. And apparently all of his preparation and the way he's, he does film study, the way he does practice prep, everything follows exactly how Eli Manning does it. To, to Gettleman's credit, if, if Jones looks anything like Eli Manning did in his career, a couple Super Bowls under his belt by the end of his career, I think the Giants uh, will be happy. I, I feel like those Super Bowls were kind of luck, if anything. 
They still, I agree, because I wanted the perfect season. <laughs> I wanted to see it in my lifetime. But I, I think uh, that... Oh, I can't I, I almost uttered dirty words. I almost wanted to say that I, I didn't want to see that, and I wanted to see the Giants insert W word here. That's but I, 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 ah, it hurts me to say those things. That's tough because you hate both of those teams. I hate them both so much. <laughs> but if, if, if Daniel Jones does have any kind of career like Eli Manning, I think he's set up to have a really good career. Um, I think he could. I think he could too. And, and, it, and he's a cut lift guy. Yeah, and I don't think the Giants fans would be would be too unhappy if he does deliver them a couple of Super Bowls. You know what I find funny, though? Do you remember those old East-West Heritage Key and Peele skits for yes. the All-Star? I kind of feel like he, he's that, he's, you know, Daniel Jones, BYU, you know? like oh, That's who that, he is. He's the guy at the very end of that. At the yes. very who's actually normal. Right. You know, he's like, you know, coming out just saying, you know, Daniel Jones, Duke. Daniel Jones, Duke. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I love it. That's very possible. But, but uh, uh, sadly, that is the end of our NFL news. However, we do have round three. Round three of, of draft day is upon us as Derek the Beer Guy has returned with Flight 3 here at City Limits Taproom in beautiful D-Land, Florida. Come on and back here Derek, and join us. what do we have here? So what's this uh, we have here? So this beautiful beverage we have in front of us is called uh, it's St. Bernardus Prior 8. It is out of Germany, and uh, actually out of Ger- Belgium. It is a Trappist beer brewed by monks. Oh, um, okay. Interesting. Brewed by uh, monks. Brewed Religious by monks. beer. Uh, so this, by it being prior to prior eight, it no, really Mr. Producer, you're not a these monk. These monks do drink beer throughout the day. They live off of a liquid diet to a degree, and this means they drink this prior to eight. Uh, I believe eight in the morning. So <laughs> wow, they, they, starting the day right. That's a actually, good way to start your day. Yes, it is a high ABV. Uh, Beer is eight percent. It's up there. It's a double. Um, means they use twice as much malt. It's very yeah, it's dark. a very dark beer. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. Woo, yeah, exactly. woo, buddy. Yeah, it's very good. Cheers. <laughs> Gross. 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 Um, as you just. Very slowly, sweet. slowly descending into drunkenness. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking darkness. about. <laughs> darkness. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Oh. <laughs> so what else? Uh, so you said this is this is brewed from uh, from Belgium. You said correct? Yeah, Belgium. It is a uh, a Trappist style beer, um, and by trap Trappist, that just means it's brewed by monks, and it has a. So, a so not brewed in a trap house or anything. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Not at all. Um, that's some some stuff that you know. We're not going to talk no, no, about no, no, that. No, let's not go down there. <laughs> That's for a uh, different show. <laughs> no, another show. It's not brewed in the bathtub. None of that. Oh, or in okay. a prison That's or good. anything. That's good. Prison good. Toilet. No, no, no toilet. No toilet shine. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, very malty. Uh, this is like a classic. I, I recommend if you want to get into your Belgian beers, Ooh. start with your Trappist style beers because those are going to okay. be the clean, the most, the best. Uh, this has been around. They've been brewing this beer since uh, the 1946. Um, I believe, and the Monacy itself has been around longer than that. Um, Very cool. Uh, what kind of, what kind of, um, kind of food do you think you would drink this with? I mean, I, I would have to recommend. Um, I feel like a good bratwurst, some sauerkraut. Um, I like a good old brat. Yeah, good, good brat, sauerkraut. Uh, maybe even. Um, it's kind of. It has a lot of yeasty notes to it. Um, and it's sweet, so anything that doesn't uh, like hearty and full, bo- like full food. Um, okay. Now, now to drink this in a full glass, do I have to wear later hosen? Uh, I mean, it would be awesome. It's encouraged. Yeah, it's very is it encouraged? encouraged? Okay, I'll have to get later hosen for the next draft day. I can get some for you. But don't tempt me. I have relatives yeah. that have later hosen. Oh, don't tempt me. I think we need to do a special once uh, German beer there. special yeah. so if you want to see if you want to see Chris here and later Hosen in a future episode of draft day make sure you drop us a line on Facebook Twitter or even on the show right now yes leave a comment leave a comment if we get what say what 50 responses 100 responses you want to do 100 even 100 even 100 if we get 100 responses I will wear later Hosen on the next episode of final score <laughs> Wait, the All next right. one? So does that... Or, or the one after. I don't know. We'll see how it works so, out. So basically what that means... In the future. Is if the day before the show, we have we don't have the, the goal, I'm going to single-handedly keep responding until we get to the 100. You set no parameters, sir. Let me, I don't even say I'm going to finalize either. You set no parameters, sir. I never said have parameters have were finalized either. You have it all. Oh, of course. I, I only go 110%. Yeah, and you got to get some <laughs> clogs in your feet. 
I might have to learn a little bit of German too. I cannot get. I can't get clogs. I'll create some if I have to. You're gonna you're gonna carve them. Carve them myself. You can carve them yourself. All right. I mean, I got free time at work these days. I'm sure you do. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Let's go for the next round. Go for the next round. Thank you so much. Did you just down? Did you down that whole thing? Right. Are you complaining? <laughs> yeah, somebody's uh, might need to have the producer go check on him in a minute. Oh, you get your squatter, sir. But uh, so <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that we want to we wanted to unveil during this show, one of the Woo. big pillars of this show has been revolving around college football. Yes, I know you've been excited for this for weeks. Oh, I'm so excited because as you know, if anybody knows Chris Wilson or Chris Carnage. Both of which are extreme. I'm talking extreme Notre Dame fans. So, you know, if they're in the same place, it's almost like having 10 fans in one place. It's very dangerous. Hey, fans. Hey, fans. <laughs> but the big thing is, though, is that we are going to be unveiling our top 25. Too early to say, but it's our too early top 25 oh. for college football. Our way too early top 25. We just got done with a lot of the spring games throughout the country. Yep. Uh, all the recruiting is done. Now we're just waiting. Go to NCAA, not switch yet. Now we're just waiting until uh, camps to start and getting ready. Uh, so let's go ahead and start from the top. I think yep, we're, we're going to start from the very top. We're pretty we're pretty close to, uh, to the same teams here at the top. We'll uh, Start at number one. We're number doing- one. Obviously, it's going to be our defending 2018 college football playoff champion, and that is none other than the Clemson Tigers, who went 15-0 and with a true freshman at quarterback, and it was a spectacle to watch. Yeah, Trevor Lawrence, I did not, I did not assume that he was going to play as strongly as he did throughout the course of the year, uh, especially in the championship game against Alabama. I figured if any team was going to take down and bring, bring this kid back down to earth, it would be the Alabama Crimson Tide. They did not do that. And they no, let, they did not. They let Trevor Lawrence run wild. They definitely let Trevor Lawrence run wild and pass wild, and that was just unprecedented given how tough Nick Saban teams always play. They always seem to have the perfect game plan or the perfect response to anything that you throw at them. And that's the thing about Alabama that was so surprising in the championship game is they completely fell apart, it seemed like. But one thing I will say, Notre Dame had a better point differential than Alabama against Clemson. Just saying. (laughs) Just saying. Just saying. But uh, I think that's one of the best performances by a true freshman. I think it's one of the best performances by a true freshman uh, in that kind of a stage of all time, honestly. Oh, absolutely. It has been. But the big thing is they lost a lot of power all the way through that team on defense, on offense. But you still return your great backup running back. You still return your starting excuse me, quarterback. And... You are going to return a generally pretty good wide receiver core. However, they are going to be without wide receiver Amari Rodgers, who tore his ACL this past March. So that definitely is going to be a big hit for that Clemson team. I think one of the things that we have to look for here is not only did they they retool. They don't just retool in when it's recruiting. They just reload. Oh, they yeah. More talent. And they have another big recruiting class again this year. And the fact that... They like to retain a lot of their assistant coaches. They actually have multiple uh, assistant coaches that are being paid over a million dollars a year. Which is unprecedented. And so a lot of credit to Dabo Sweeney for keeping this coaching staff together. So that way they can just, again, being the overwhelming favorite in the ACC, I see no competition for them in the ACC, and they're just going to roll right through. I think they they stand undefeated going into the college football playoff. And I think they'll honestly hit the college football playoff as the number one seed just because of how their schedule will work out, especially in the ACC, because the ACC is generally weak right now. FSU is not what it used to be. Miami is still trying to find its way. Virginia Tech has literally fallen on hard times ever since they lost their their longtime head coach, Frank Beamer. So when you look at a lot of these teams, a lot of them are just not going to be able to challenge. Duke might have had a shot, maybe, but Daniel Jones is now gone. So no one is going to be able to challenge in the ACC. Clemson rolls eight no in the ACC play and goes to the ACC title game and probably wins in dominating fashion. I agree. I agree with you there. Number two, again, we match the same. We have Alabama 
at number two, 14 and one last year, eight zero in the SEC West. Uh, I just think this is going to come down to yet another Alabama and Clemson championship game, barring anything crazy, because you know how crazy the SEC can be in the West. <laughs> or if you have Chattanooga, that's only down seven nothing at halftime. <laughs> just saying. They ended up winning quite handily in that game. Well, you know, that bygones be bygones. They're a Division well, 1A, you, AA. When, when you schedule high school teams as your non-conference games, you're going to have really good seasons. <laughs> well, maybe if they had gotten Mater Day or maybe Hoover or Lakeland, maybe they would have had a better competition. Who knows? I don't but, know, maybe. But either way, though, Alabama, though, went through a large large turnover in on the coaching side uh, including bringing back some coaches that were formerly a part of the team like uh, Steve Sarkeesian so it's definitely going to be interesting seeing how the, re- the coaching staff has really been retooled and they did have a certain number of players transfer like Jalen Hurts which we'll touch on next uh, was one of those big players that left however you still do have two attack uh, tackle viola who ha- apparently was put on notice by Nick Saban recently uh, so we'll definitely see how it plays out going forward and I don't, I don't know. I don't know if they're going to be able to recapture the same magic necessarily to get to this level. However, you can never count out a Nick Saban team. So expect Alabama to not only be in the mix for the SEC title, but definitely be in the mix for the college football playoff. Alabama, year in and year out, they do things with they've, – they've done things with some even guys that were no name at the beginning of the year. And Nick Saban knows how to coach his guys up. He knows how to get the best out of every player that walks through his door. And I think they're going to really just run into run into some potential. <laughs> What's going on? Sorry, I accidentally shot a piece of paper into the producer's drink, and I feel really bad. I didn't oh, see it. <laughs> Wait a minute. Now you owe him a Oh, now something just attacked me. Oh, it was a coaster. You owe him a beer. I owe you a beer. Tell him to put it on my tab, Mr. Producer. <laughs> But I think Alabama, no matter what, they know how to get the best out of their guys. And even when... They do. Nick Saban has done more with less. Wait, are you showing that in the camera? (laughs) As you can see, there it is. (laughs) There it is. (laughs) <laughs> All right, so that's number two. Top two are the same. Now we start getting a little different. Now we're going to get different because at number three, three I, have, go first. I have Oklahoma, who had a great season last season with quarterback Kyler Murray, who now got drafted to the Arizona Cardinals. <laughs> great move that was. So at the end of the day, though, they've been able to have not only last year's Heisman winner, but both also the previous year's Heisman Trophy winner with quarterbacks Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield. Now, Baker Mayfield has gone gone on to do great things in Cleveland already in such a short amount of time. Now, we also expect Cleveland to be one of the top teams this next season with Baker at the helm. So they are obviously able to pump out quarterbacks. And funny enough, they have former Alabama quarterback Jalen Hurts now transferred in and cemented as the starter for this upcoming season. My number three goes a little bit different. Mine, uh, I go with Georgia out of the SEC East. They went 11-3 and last year, 7-1 in the SEC East. They have come heartbreakingly close to dethroning Alabama in each of the past two seasons. But head coach Kirby Smart continues to reload this team in recruiting. They boast another top two recruiting class for mm-hmm. the Georgia Bulldogs. I think it's Alabama-Georgia in the SEC title game again this year. Winner gets the second seed potentially in the college football playoff. I'd absolutely have to agree with that because they are honestly head and shoulders above the rest. Even though the SEC has even gotten stronger going into this season, when you look at the makeup of Alabama and Georgia and just the amazing recruiting that Nick Saban and Kirby Smart have both been able to do, it's just been paramount to those programs to be where they are now because it's funny because looking at my number four is also georgia now also they did have justin fields transfer out but when you still have jake Fromm sitting as your starter you ain't got no worries jake Fromm's already proven himself on a big stage that he can play so if others are able to come in around him and do the same this georgia team literally sky's the limit I have to agree with you there. My number four is is Oklahoma, so we just flip flop three and four. Funny how that works. Uh, for all the reasons that you stated about Oklahoma, with Jalen Hurts coming in, uh, and Jalen Hurts was twenty six and two as a starter uh, at Alabama, but uh, they're returning ten starters on defense. Even though it was very porous last year, they did bring in uh, Ohio State's defensive coordinator Alex Grinch to help uh, take the place of Stoops, who mm-hmm. was the previous head. Uh, defensive coordinator and uh, i think they basically they have very little competition in the big 12 texas is the only other team that might 
step up. I to mean, them? we didn't have other teams that did step up, but a lot of them lost players, especially like the West Virginias of the world who had West Will Greer, Virginia, Iowa State, Iowa State, and, and stuff and so forth. I don't feel those teams are really going to be able. They'll be have good right. teams, but they're not going to be able to challenge for the Big Twelve title. I agree. I think Oklahoma wins the Big Twelve title pretty handily. Uh, if they have one loss in the Big Twelve, it'll be to like a Texas or maybe oh, yeah. like an Oklahoma State or something like that. But uh, that's the uh, top four. Well, we're going to take a small break take because a, take a break now? Derek okay. the Beer Guy is bringing in round four of draft day here on draft day. <laughs> Derek, what you got for us? So what we have here is a New England style IPA. Ooh, okay. Uh, New England a, style? It's by a brewery called Lord Hobo. They're notoriously <laughs> known for their very uh, strong uh, IPA styles. Uh, this particular one's called Boom Sauce. Uh, oh, wow. And it's very, ooh, very smelly. Yeah, it smells very uh, uh, aromatic. <laughs> yes. Very aromatic. That's the proper word, uh, not just smelly. Yeah, not yeah. Sorry, you can tell aromatic. I've been drinking. Sorry, fans. Aromatic uh, has citrus, mm. a lot of citrus notes there. A little bit of dank, mm. you know, like I mean the dank. Very danky. Three people know what I'm talking about out there. <laughs> yeah. uh, Family show, Derek. Daddy. Family oh, sorry, show. Sorry, 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 but they'll be mainstream. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, it's um, <laughs> yeah, it's got a very uh, very good s- strong hint to it. Is it just very hoppy? Yeah, it's a, it's an IPA. It's a New England style IPA, but there, mm. it's not necessarily overly hop or bitter. Uh, it actually is well balanced. I don't know if you yeah. if you drink enough IPAs, but uh, it actually I'm is. Not, I'm not terribly too in, much into IPA, but I do uh, I do like to test them. They're they're yeah. very good beers to drink. Yeah, they can be sessionable. Whew. Definitely yeah. good. Definitely a nice festive time. We got people singing over it here. It is a yeah. high ABV. I believe it's around seven to eight percent range. Okay. Nice, um, nice. So I'm gonna get you drunk. Clarity. Okay. A little yeah, a little clearer. It's a little clearer uh, than that. Uh, the 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 German beer we had on earlier. The Hefeweizen. The Hefeweizen, yes. But still, definitely has a lot of the strong citrus tones with yes. it. Definitely could taste that alcohol. That's what you, you what you get with your typical IPA. Um, yeah. But this is one of the better ones, and honestly, Lord Hobo. Most of their stuff is amazing. Um, a shout out to Brandon uh, for bringing this one on tap. Is this, um, this, this is Brandon's tap? Yes. Okay, very cool. Um, Good job, before, Brandon. I did not mention who brought in the prior eight. I do want to make clarification on that. Laura did bring that in, but prior eight means they drink that beer prior to 8 p.m. at night because they do ah. make a patter six, which is after six in the morning, which is a lower ABV uh, beer uh, to have. So I can drink that up. at like 6.15. Yeah, if you want it. So basically what they're saying is if you want to go be a monk, you just get to drink beer. Well, I mean... I like that. It's a very structured <laughs> life. It yeah, is. it's very structured, but you drink But, but it includes beer. beer. It does include some beer, yes. <laughs> yes, it does include some are you, beer. Are you saying you want to be a monk, Craig? I did not say that. Is it because you have the hairstyle that it's can fit it? It's because I'm already partly there. I wasn't going to go there, but... I mean, you got the high the profile, the hairstyle. Yeah, I mean, I'm... Aren't most monks short too? I'm short. Yeah, yeah, so you're short. Course. You're kind of bald. You just gotta get you some robes and a beer in your hand. And you're Bam. well, you already got the beer in your hand. So we the beer in my what hand. if we can get toga. a we we'll get hundred likes or hundred responses? Hey, so hundred likes, hundred responses. <laughs> get me. Oh, hey, yeah, we can get this guy in some that? monk clothes. You gotta shave his head. Okay, so either I'll actually nine. shave my head. You'll shave his head more shaved than it already is. So you just Girl, need to. Uh, my friend will be pissed, but you know. So you just need to, to message. <laughs> it's only temporary. Either, it's only temporary. Either later hosen or monk. Monk is easier, and you can get him in a monk outfit. Maybe for the next episode, of final it's score. It's easier to get later hosen for you. What are you talking about? Hey, I can find some monk. So groups. the battle begins. You wish you <laughs> we get hundred <laughs> likes. We should. We will each individually do. Yes. Our, our costumes for the next uh, next show. Yes. <laughs> or for the next draft day, maybe. Maybe for the next yeah. draft day. Host, we, I would imagine we're going to host draft oh, day. Oh, we're, we're going to do this again and at some whoever point. Whoever gets the most, I will match. Oh! <laughs> Derek the beer guy you're said gonna, he will match. you hear first from Derek. That's I right. I really don't want to shave my head. Wait, wait, you better vote for those. Well, I mean, I'm not shaving my head either. I can't I vote can't mess for, up the beautiful Chris Car- I mean, Chris Wilson hair. Later, Hosen. Later, Hosen. Vote for the later, Hosen. Hosen. All right, gentlemen. All oh, right. Cheers. cheers. Thank you so much. Round Salud. Four. All right. Thank you. Woo! Always All a good right. time here at City Limits. Always a lot of fun here. Uh, so we're on number five. We're rounding out our top five. We actually both, again, have the same team. Look we at that. We both have the, um, I'll let you say it. 
Oh, because uh, you just like calling the team from the north, right? I can't. Or the south. I don't know how what you guys call them. I call well, technically, them. I'm actually south of this state, but we actually call it the team down south. Well, I call this team the Ohio State Buckeyes, which we both have at number five. Now, with Ohio State, it's very interesting. They went 13-1 and one last season. Did have a really good season, but honestly, uh, obviously fell short. But they do have a quarterback coming in, transfer from Georgia, Justin Fields, who has been able to sit behind Jake Fromm and learn not only from Jake Fromm, but Kirby Smart. So it's been, this is a prepared player, and they say he always looked really good in practice, definitely could step in and start and be able to be that guy you need. So it's definitely going to be interesting to see how he fits in to this now new offense because Urban Meyer has stepped down. He is no longer the head coach at Ohio State. I agree, and I think... uh where really what happened with this, Justin Fields comes in. He did. He has been practicing well, but he did not look great in the spring game. No. Uh, so, I mean, you're, you're really kind of wondering, is this going to be the guy moving forward? But Ryan Day was the guy who ran the offense last year. He's taking over now the reins. And I expect this offense with three other three other big key returning starters on offense to, uh, to continue to score points. Definitely. Running back J.K. Dobbins, wideouts K.J. Hill, and Austin Mack. But really what's going to carry this team to potentially win the Big Ten and even further potentially in the college football playoff is going to be that stout defense. Definitely. They lost one starter from last year's defense, Ooh. and he was a top five pick. Yeah, which is unprecedented because now you're going to have a defense that's so complete and so seasoned that they truly could be one of the best defenses, not only the Big Ten, but in the entire landscape of college football. Yeah, I think once it gets down to the end of the year, this defense is going to carry the load for the beginning and half of the season until yes. the offense finds their rhythm. And then by the end of the season, I think you could potentially see a very scary Buckeye team in the Big Ten. You definitely, definitely could. But moving on to the to the next team that I have, I'm going to take the reins on this one, is my team, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish at number six. Now, a lot of people want to crap on Notre Dame because they got bullied by Clemson in the college football playoff, losing 30-3. to However... That game was decided by the fact that Julian Love, who got drafted into the NFL, was out for the second and third quarter of that game with an injury. And when they scored, Clemson, that is, scored most of their touchdowns, was against the corner that slotted in for Julian Love. So, honestly, that game could have been a lot closer than it actually was. However, the offense wasn't able to get going under Ian Book and Dexter Williams, so it ended up setting them back a lot in that game. However, they beat the crap out of a lot of teams last year, setting all kinds of offensive marks and defensive marks for the team. Now, you also have to keep in mind that last season was the first year under Ian Book as the starting quarterback. And now there also is no more Brandon Wimbush to worry about because Brandon Wimbush has transferred out, which we'll cover more in a little bit later. But with how Notre Dame figures to come in, they return a lot of their defensive starters. However, they are missing Jeffrey Tillery, who was a very disruptive defensive lineman for them. And with him gone, they kind of wonder if that defensive line is going to be able to be as dominant. But with a lot of the recruiting they've done, especially under Brian Kelly, they might be able to get that defense back and around. But they do return a great linebacking core and a great secondary. So we'll definitely see what will happen. But the big note to take from the spring game, Ian Book is not only more comfortable in this offense, but has gotten to the point where he feels like he can step in and do anything he needs to, like a Peyton Manning, if you will, to be able to get this offense to the next level. It's high praise there, sir. Oh, it is high praise, and I will leave it there. So we have number six and seven swapped yet again. I have LSU at number six, Notre Dame at number seven. LSU, I think they are going to perform about the same way they did this year. They had a Coming off a ten and three season, five and three in the SEC West, yep. losing against uh, losing against some of the top tier teams. I think LSU mm-hmm. does a similar path this year. They have also, just like Michigan, have tried to open up their offense a little bit more, a little bit more of a spread offense. Yeah. So you kind of saw that at their spring game, but I think this could be really six through ten can be any any order really. It definitely could. These teams could potentially move up and jockey for those positions. I think LSU is going to finish behind Alabama in the SEC West, but they're still going to be strong enough in the national spotlight that they'll probably be roughly around in the top 10, top 15. As for Notre Dame, I do agree with you. Ian Book does a lot look, look a lot more comfortable, um, but they only have I think it was six returning starters on 
offense, five yes. on defense, something like that. Roughly. So they do have a lot of re reloading to do, but being an independent you get to play essentially whatever schedule you want, so your schedule is probably going to be easier than most. And the, you've got to think of Stanford's down. Yep. USC way down. They're not what those two teams are not what they were. Uh, I'm 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 actually blanking. I didn't I don't have the schedule for Notre Dame this year, but you guys are playing. Uh, you guys are playing Michigan, I believe. We do play Michigan. Uh, we Michigan are playing State. Stanford, USC, Michigan State. I do not believe is actually on the schedule not this year. Uh, we do open. Oh my goodness, I can't even remember right now. I've had too many, too many but, beers from draft day. But the idea is, I think your schedule is favorable for the for the Notre Dame, so that way they can make another run at a college football playoff. But it really is going to come down to can Ian Book keep this offense moving. All right, so now looking, that he's now that he's comfortable and in, in that he's definitely the number one guy in this offense. He definitely is, and the biggest thing is going to be replacing Dexter Williams, which they feel like they do have a running back that could slot in for that. But the thing is, is that Notre Dame's always run with a multi stable of running backs. But looking at their schedule, they do have to open up uh, with Louisville, which will definitely be a very interesting game, uh, especially since how Louisville has been down for the past about year or two ever since Lamar Jackson left and got drafted by the Ravens. But looking at the rest of their schedule, some of it's cupcakes, some of it is not. They have to play New Mexico, Virginia, Bowling Green, uh, Duke, Virginia Tech, Boston College. All teams that are going to be having down years. Uh, and Navy. Let's not forget Navy. Big rivalry. Uh, but you look at other teams that really could step up. The Stanfords of the world. USC. Uh, Michigan. Who, yeah, we're not even going to talk about Michigan. Uh, I, think, I think the toughest games on their schedule is going to be at Georgia. Is going to be a big one. Definitely going to be the biggest U- one. USC is always a very charged game, as is the Navy game, as is the Stanford game. But I think those are all winnable games. Uh, Virginia Tech's a really interesting team, but they always play very hard against your Notre Dame uh, fighting Irish. Huh, not so much this last season. And, of course, the one game that I got scheduled happens right around my birthday, that uh, Michigan-Notre Dame game at Michigan. I'm thinking, Ooh. actually, I know uh, some alumni in Michigan. I think we should try to do a final score on location. I mean, I know I'm a Notre Dame fan, but I'm definitely down to go to the big house. Want to do it? Let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Okay. I'll get, I'll get a hold of I'll get a hold of my people. But uh, so that is 6 and 7. Moving on to number 8. That's where I have my Michigan Wolverines, 10 and 3, 8 and 1 in the Big 10 East. The reason I have them here is yes, they lost a lot on defense, but Don Brown has got that Michigan defense. They just reload guys back into that defense mm-hmm. and they fly around the field. Big reason I have here we don't want to put too much stock into spring games. Of course. But new offensive coordinator Josh Gaddis comes from Alabama, and he's going to give this offense a shot in the arm that they desperately need in the passing attack. We'll Michigan's, see if Shea Patterson can actually handle it. He will. He can handle it. <laughs> and he's in his – now it's his last year, but it's his second season under center. It is. He is the guy. And guess what? If you don't like how he's performing, you've got guys behind him. Dylan McCaffrey, Joe Milton. You've got guys that are talented but just haven't seen the field that much. This is true. So you've got the potential there. That quarterback room is so stacked nationally at Michigan. Uh, I'll be really excited to see how they go from here. But what you got at number eight? Well, to take back to my number seven, because I think you got so excited just to get to Michigan that you just ended up jumping ahead. But for my LSU, the big thing I want to point out is that with Ed, o- Ed Orgeron coming in as their coach, who wasn't even expected to be their coach when they had Les Miles, he has ended up slotting in, has been able to do a wonderful, wonderful job down there in Baton Rouge to be able to turn the LSU Tigers back in the type of perennial power they used to be, boasting a 10-win season this past season. Now, obviously, they, use, they lose Greedy Williams on defense. Very well in these years under Ed Odron. I forget the I forget the the kid's name, but they have a safety that's very highly touted that's coming in and playing for LSU this year. And apparently, throughout the course of the the spring practices and the spring game, he has looked phenomenal. And he's going to be the next, you know, big playmaker on their uh, on their defense. So we'll be excited to see that. Uh, so you have LSU there at number seven. Yes. Uh, who's your number eight team? So looking at my number eight is none other than the Texas Longhorns, who did boast a great season going 10-4 and four, and did beat Oklahoma in the Red River rivalry down at the Texas State Fair last year. So that's definitely a thing to keep in mind. Now, Texas was not expected to have the type of season that they did. It was seen to be more of a rebuilding year, especially with a new quarterback coming in. You have a new uh, 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 head coach and with Herman coming in. So a lot of stuff was going on. But 
they were able to get themselves to a respectful 10-4 and four season and a 7-2 and two mark in Big 12 play. So Texas definitely can make the noise. It's just really if they're able to get a lot of these younger players to take that next step because Texas was one of the youngest teams in all of college football last season. So definitely a thing to keep in mind. But before we move on to our number nines, we yeah. do have got Derek round back five of draft day. Derek coming back in. That's right. Derek the beer guy. Beer, 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 beer. <laughs> Sounds like he's at a club, but it's yeah. actually he's saying beer. Yeah, he is saying beer. We promise. All right, Derek, what do beer, we beer, got? beer, beer, beer. Um, what we have here is Duke Claw Brewing out of Maryland, uh, and this is you're gonna get a kick out of this one. Oh wow! This is a chocolate peanut butter porter American Whoa. porter style. It smells delicious. And the name of this beer is called Sweet Baby Jesus. <laughs> Sweet Baby Jesus. And that's exactly that, what I'm saying. Is I'm trying to look through it. That might it, be. Go ahead. I'm trying to look at this through our, our, our uh, studio lighting here, and uh, all I see is black. <laughs> yeah, That's what you're going to get with a good porter. Uh, porter's usually dark. I mean, next level is stouts. Um, oh, my gosh. It it's smells a good so amazing. One. We're on our dessert beer section. There's two of them. This is the end of the night off, uh, second to last. So this is the happy ending. This is the happy ending. <laughs> this tastes delicious. It does taste delicious. You said it's a chocolate peanut butter porter. Chocolate peanut butter American porter, yes. American porter. Now, what's the ABV on this? This is actually, a, I want to say, 6.4. Don't do my hands. <laughs> uh, I'm getting there. Uh, percent. Uh, so, for a dessert beer, it is pretty high. Um, usually, you you know, 5% range, more sessionable, right. a little bit heavier. But this being a porter, it is in the lighter, maybe medium body side. Um but you you get the the gist. It's very sweet. Mm-hmm. It's a and night you and the night off. You know. Yeah, it's very delicious. Mm-hmm. Mm, and who makes this one again? Duclaw Brewing out of Maryland. Duclaw Brewing. Brewing. This Brewing. is probably the best named beer I've ever heard of. Yeah. Oh yes. Sweet baby Jesus. Sweet baby sweet Jesus. Baby Jesus. Tal Nights. Yeah, exactly. Lord, uh, I'm on fire. There is there's actually one beer that it, this reminds me of, and it's up in uh, Jacksonville Beach, Florida. It's um. It's called Count Chocula, but it tastes like the cereal Count Chocula. Okay. And it's I a can see that. but it's a stout. We need to get I that on the that. show. I know like, we need to tastes, find that. It tastes just like this. I think we need to buy a a, a, a tap. Oh, we should get specifically a tap. for the final score tap. The final, the final score, score tap. tap. I like it. Oh. Yeah. We can write that off, right? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I mean hey, that. one of the owners Producer, is here. We can write this. We can write off, this right? off, right? Of course we can. Yeah. That's because we we're part of the it. Podcast City Network. We might have to do this. All which right. you can find online at podcastcity.net. Very good. All right, so yeah. sweet baby Jesus. Yes. All right. Yes, sweet baby Jesus. Awesome. Well, thank you for the... What's this, round five now? This is round five. Round Only five. We got one left. more after this. Only one more and left. then we get the vote. Yes, then we get a vote at the very end. Oh, I've, this is already front runner for me. Oh. I think this might be mine as well. Oh, oh we don't want to give it away. We don't want to give it away. To be continued. The, to be continued. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you, Derek. Appreciate round five. Thank you so much. We'll be awaiting round six shortly. But oh, uh, yes. back to our top 25 college football. We were at number eight, and you had Texas yes. sitting there at number eight. Uh, we are, I had already talked about Michigan. I actually have Texas at number nine. So hmm. like I said, six through ten for us is pretty Very tight. Pretty just pick your choose whoever you want. But I have Texas there at number nine. For a lot of the same reasons you have them at number eight. They were coming off a 10-win season, but they now have stability at QB last year. For once. Yeah, for once. It's been a while. Since like the Colt McCoy days, really. Pretty much, yeah. (laughs) Since the Colt McCoy days. But now that they have stability at quarterback, it's year three under Tom Herman, and he has done a tremendous job with the Texas Longhorns. And they should be in the mix for the Big 12, assuming they don't have a goose egg of a game. The two games that they lost, one of them was to Oklahoma State, which I attended that game last year. Like, oh, look at that. Hey. a lot of fun. I'll say. Uh, but uh, assuming that they can beat, win the games that they're supposed to win, they should be in the mix for the Big 12. But here is the big key. Their defense did not play well last year through stretches. They need their defense to step up and step up to the offense. 
Oh, yes, definitely would have to. Looking at my number nine, though, I have the Florida Gators. Now, they boasted a 10-win season, which a lot of people didn't know was going to happen, given the fact the Florida Gators kind of fell on tough times, especially at the quarterback position. They really haven't had any kind of stability at quarterback, I would say, even as far back as the Tim Tebow days. So That's pretty accurate. Now you have, uh, I think it's uh, 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 Felipe, Felipe Franks, Felipe Franks yep. and you have Dan Mullen now coming in. So this is going to be Dan interesting. Dan Mullen's our coach. Yes, Dan Mullen's the coach. I know. He's in year three. Year three. Sorry, I've been drinking way year too two, much. I'm sorry, year two. See, you don't even know. <laughs> so anyway, no, Dan Mullen is going into year two, which is really good. He did really great in his first year going 10-3, and th- uh, three, I believe. 10-3, and three, yep. Yes, 10-3, and 5-3 and three in SEC play. So all three losses did come in conference play. So it definitely goes to show that they can definitely take care of their – out of conference slate, but it's really taking care of the in conference slate because they ended up having losses, I think, to Tennessee in that dramatic game that ended with the Hail Mary. Yep. Ended up having a loss to Georgia. They lost, I think, Kentucky as well, right? And to Kentucky on the road in Kentucky. Yeah. So or, uh, it's definitely been very, very interesting for them. So if the Gators can really shore up a lot of things, especially defensively, they might be able to actually make a decent little run in the SEC. However, I feel like they don't have the amount of depth and talent to be able to match up against a Georgia. Because Georgia, in my, in my opinion, is taking the SEC East no matter what. Missouri has lost Drew Locke. Tennessee lost half their players. And the Gators just aren't quite there. The Gators will be number two. But they're not going to be able to take down Georgia. I'm going to have to agree with you there. You got you got Florida at number nine. I actually have them at number ten uh, for a lot of the same reasons. But they... Not only did they were they one of the most improved teams last year. They started they were four and seven to ten and three in Dan Mullen's first year. But Felipe Franks really needs to improve if they want to be a threat to Georgia in the SEC East. I don't see them losing to many teams uh, in their division uh, outside of maybe a Georgia because they play the game in Jacksonville every year. But here's the big thing that I want to point out about Florida's schedule. They open the season against Miami in Orlando, so they don't have to go very far. Mm -hmm. So they open that. Then they only leave Florida four times for road games in the year. And you're talking about a a 13-game season. They only leave the state of Florida four times. That's pretty big. They go at Kentucky, at LSU, at South Carolina, at Missouri. All of those games outside of LSU are winnable games. You should win those games. So, I mean, they have a very favorable schedule as far as the SEC goes. And that's not saying – that's saying a lot because the SEC traditionally has been a very, very tough conference to win in. But I think they can do well enough. They could definitely rise up higher than 10 here. Oh, definitely. But uh, it'll really depend on how they do in – you know, in in conference, really, and they're going to have to draw a lot of proving to do because once they get into those conference slated games, that's going to be the huge testing point for this Gators team, especially on offense. Because if Felipe Franks can't step in and make magic happen, this offense will stall and they will not produce points. They do have they do have a true freshman that's coming in that should push Felipe Franks to at least to compete for that starting job. Mm -hmm. So if Felipe Franks can be the clear-cut number one, I think he'll be a little bit more comfortable. They were finally a little bit more balanced. They could actually run the football last year. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? And their defense was actually pretty stout. So if they can continue that uh, coming into next year, I think they can have a really good shot in the SEC East, and they just got to get over that Georgia hurdle, which I don't think they can do. No, I don't think they can either. But looking at my number 10, I have your Michigan Wolverines. Now, I... Too low, bro. Oh, no. Hey, you're still top 10. Be happy. <laughs> I wanted to put I'll you at 127, it. but I had to be realistic. Be and real. the producer came to me and said, listen, Chris, you have to be realistic about these rankings or it's going to seem like you're biased. And I was like, you know what? You're right, but I still want to rank them 127. <laughs> then he told me he'd have to write me off the show, so I said I would cave. So at the end of the day, since I can't put Michigan at 127th on this list, you Dude, are at number I had 10. Notre Dame at 128. Well, damn you. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to be nice and see you were, say you were at least better than uh, what the Charlotte 49ers. Aren't there only 127 teams? I thought it was 129. I lost count. 129. I had them at 130 then. <laughs> I don't know how we keep anyway. you or me around. <laughs> anyway. But anyways, I have Michigan at number 10. Let me, now, let me have it. Come on. All right. So the big thing about Michigan. Michigan was honestly great to start the season out, except when you played Notre Dame, and then fell flat on their face in games that they honestly should have won. Completely agree. And the thing that I feel with Michigan, Harbaugh does know what he's doing. I will give him that much credit. Shea Patterson is also not a bad quarterback. 
However, I don't think Shea Patterson is disciplined enough to be able to get you guys to the promised land. And that's the big thing that I fear with Michigan. Your defense also took a hit, losing with Shaw Gary and among many others. So with that, I don't know if the defense is going to be fully there. I think he'll be good in Big Ten play. But outside of that, and also against top-tier t- uh, talent, like the team from the South, Ohio State Buckeyes, I think those are the teams that are really going to give you problems. And Shea Patterson, I think, in those games is not going to play that great. So I could see you guys being able to mimic what you did last year and have another 10-3, and three, maybe even 11-2 and two season. But I don't think you guys are going to be able to run the slate and beat the teams with the superior talent and not even the superior talent but the better depth in teams like Ohio State. I definitely could see where that, that could come up. Um, I think – one big thing with Shea Patterson's development is you look at the type of offense they ran at Ole Miss. Yeah. Very wide open, spread the ball. Very wide open. What happened last year? Jim, uh, Jim Harbaugh, I formation, run the ball. I formation, run the ball. Oh, let's run a pro formation. We're going to throw a five-yard yes. pass on third down. That yes. is Jim Harbaugh's play calling, and that is definitely what needed to be out the door three years ago. Yes. Now we got a new offensive coordinator who opens up the field. He actually, he's going to be the one doing the play calling. Jim Arba is no longer doing play calling. And I think that in and of itself is going to help push this offense a little bit further than what they're normally used to. Mm-hmm. It's It's been since the Chad Henney and Braylon Edwards days. Woo, you threw it back. That we've seen this kind of an offense from Michigan that's not normal. Yes, Very I do, true. Yes, I do believe Ohio is going to be the biggest hurdle for Michigan. I think they could also be undefeated going into that game. They could also be go undefeated going into that game against Ohio. Well, they definitely so could be. It's possible because because for the fact that Notre Dame is going to be a home game at Michigan, uh, a lot of their big games this year are going to be at home. The only games they really play on the road, you're playing at Wisconsin on the road. Uh, you're going to play at Penn State on the road. But all the other big games are at home. Michigan State's at home. Ohio State's at home. Notre Dame's at home. Iowa's at home. I think all the big games are at home this year, so it's really going to be a. I think it's a make or break year for Jim Harbaugh. To be oh, absolutely, I have to agree. Michigan fans, we are, we're we're happy that we're getting ten wins every year. That that's awesome. We still have yet to hit the college football playoff. We're desperate for that kind of success again. And I think if Harbaugh doesn't do it this year, he better really watch his butt because he's going to be on the hot seat if he doesn't do it. Oh, absolutely. And I have to agree with that because Harbaugh's been trying to make it happen in Michigan. And it's not that he's been recruiting bad, but things just haven't come through. And I think a lot of it was like you mentioned with the type of offense that they were running in the I form for the quarterback that's more uh, set up for a spread style offense. So bringing in this offensive coordinator who really could change things around for you might be the key to try and spark Michigan to have a really standout season. However, I know you're not going to lose to Notre Dame. Notre Dame's probably going to win by 40, and you're just going to have to accept the <laughs> fact that Notre Dame is just a better team. We'll have to see. That might have been alcohol-induced. I'm not going to lie. I think we might have to put a little final score-friendly wager on this. Oh, we will. Some we kind will. Of, it might not have to. When we, do our, when we do our preseason college football coverage later in the year, we're definitely putting a wager down. Once we come up to this game, we're going to have to put a little wager down. Well, of course, we don't bet money because that's illegal here. Yes, yes, that is massively That's illegal, illegal. But we're going to do something. Wait, isn't sports betting legal now or something? Or sports betting is not legal in Florida. Okay. Ah, they just haven't set the books up yet. Anyways, <laughs> but now that so we've, number, out of the top ten, let's go to the next. Yeah, now team. that we're through the top ten, we're going to try and breeze through some of these next ones and just yep. take a quick look at a lot of these teams. Uh, number eleven, we both have Oregon. Oregon definitely did have a decent year last year, going nine and four, five and four in Pac-12 play. Uh, what is what some of the big uh, hurdles that Oregon's going to have? Uh, well, really, the big thing is they're they're looking at uh, they're they didn't win the Pac-12 North last year. Nope. That went to Washington, but they're going to be in the mix because quarterback Justin Herbert, who's going to be one of the top quarterback prospects in next year's NFL draft. Yes, he's coming back. He's also going to be a Heisman candidate. So oh I yeah, think they have to be one of the favorites coming back into the Pac-12 in 2019. So I think that's why I have them slated at number 11. I think they have just enough that they can win the Pac-12 North. Absolutely. And looking at number 12, I have Washington sitting there, the Huskies. At 10, they went 10 and 4 last year, 7 and 2 in conference play. Uh, we're a very well-rounded team, but lost a lot of pieces in the draft defensively and a little bit offensively. So I don't know if Washington's going to be able to stay up with an Oregon, but Washington definitely will be there to try and make some noise throughout the season. 
My number 12, I have Texas A&M in the SEC. They went 9-4 and four last year, 5-3 and three in the SEC West. Texas A&M went all in with the head coach Jimbo Fisher, pulling him from Florida State, and it's already paying dividends for the Aggies. They won nine games last season for the first time since 2013. They routed NC State 52 to 13 in the Tax Slayer Gator Bowl, and they had the number three recruiting class coming into this year. Huge. So here's the big hiccup for Texas A&M. They have a brutal schedule in 2019. Very. This could really make or break this year. They could have all four or five of these losses. All five losses could really spell into a terrible season for A&M. They're at Clemson, at Georgia, at LSU, but they do have two home games against Auburn and Alabama. Those five games are going to be super crucial to how this season turns out for the A&M Aggies. I definitely have to agree 110% because I also have Texas A&M slotted at number 13 on my list for a lot of the same reasons. And Jimbo Fisher is really going to have to try and come into his own and get his team to rally around one another to be able to make a big push in the SEC West, to be able to contend with the Alabamas, the Auburns, all these big juggernauts that you have that are going to try and make a big challenge against Jimbo Fisher and these Aggies. But... Looking at number 14, I have UCF, who went 12-1 and last season. Obviously, they had the big upset in the bowl game after losing uh, Milton McKenzie to that gruesome, gruesome knee injury. So definitely going to be huge. And as the guy is asking over here, yes, I am the biggest Notre Dame fan that you will find. And you know what? I've got to deal with him, too. And you know what's oh, funny about terrible. that? He's a Michigan this fan. Is so, anyways, this is awful. <laughs> that being said, this is that, the worst way this could have happened. It is, but it's okay because you know what? There's two teams that could beat the crap out of Michigan all right, all right, in the big down. house. Calm so, down. that down. being said, at number 14, I do have Central Florida. All so, right. like I said, quarterback Milton McKenzie is going to be coming off a very very, very gruesome knee injury that he suffered in the final game last season. And what really makes me wonder is if he's even going to be available. However, UCF is going to luck out because they are getting Notre Dame transfer quarterback Brandon Wimbush who's going to step in. Now, with this, he's a dual-threat quarterback that has a decent arm but only shows flashes of good accuracy. So I don't know if that's going to necessarily help or, or, or hurt them in the end. I think they're really going to be leaning on trying to get uh, McKenzie back. So one of the things I'm looking at, I have UCF at number 13, actually, and uh, you have them at 14. I have them at 13. They did they did go 12-1, and 8-0 uh, eight, eight in the AAC. Brian, uh, Brandon Winbush, though, he should be a nice replacement for Mackenzie Milton. Yes. Josh Hupel can get the best out of his players on the offensive end. He's a very offensive. Yes, yes. He's a very offensive coach. I think they're going to do very well, and they're going to win. They're going to blow through everybody. In their conference, they're going to do very well in the national spotlight against the non-conference, but I think they're going to be the group of five team in the New Year's Six Bowl yet again this year, and I think they're going to represent that group of five in, in some sort of big bowl game. But I have them at number 13. My number 14 is actually going to be Utah. The Ooh, Utes. The, the Utes. Utes. So they won the Pac-12 South last year, and they're, the, they're possibly the favorites again this year, possibly even more depending on how their schedule falls. They have key returners at quarterback, running back, receiver, tight end, and corner. But one of the other things that is in Utah's favor, their schedule. Yes. They have a manageable non-conference schedule. They're playing at BYU, home against Northern Illinois, and against Idaho State. And they don't have to play Oregon or Stanford in the Pac-12 play. Mm. I think that's going to look very, very well on Utah's schedule. I think that definitely will help them out. And then looking at our number 15, we both have Syracuse, the Orange Men. Sitting there, the good Syracuse Orange, who went 10 and 3 and 6 and 2 in ACC play last season, played great under their head coach, who ended up getting him a new deal. And Syracuse just honestly doesn't matter who they played, they look so amazing. This is like a Syracuse of old with Donovan McNabb playing quarterback. It was truly amazing. Well, they did lose uh, Dungy at their at their quarterback, but I also have them at 15 just because of. Who's in their conference? They they went six and two in the ACC last year, but they have Clemson in their division. But other than that, they have nobody else. Florida State is not who they used to be. They don't have that much of competition. NC State, Duke are all in that conference in that division. So I have I see them I see them having a favorable schedule yet again this year. They won ten games for the first time in seventeen seasons last year. 
And here's here's how their schedule looks out. They're only going to play one Power 5 non-conference opponent, which is Maryland, who's not great in the Big Ten. No, and honestly, they got lucky at that point. And their ACC road games are at Duke, Florida State, Louisville, NC State. All of those games are winnable games, especially based on Duke's down, FSU is not what they used to be, Louisville's down, NC State also down, losing their their quarterback. Yeah, they lost their quarterback too, who randomly I think got drafted by the New England Patriots, so we'll probably see him become a great one day, but at the end of the day though, Syracuse has been a really good program coming on these past few years, so definitely need to watch out for them, because I feel like just with the coaching, they might be able to start doing the plug and play effect that a lot of teams get to enjoy They're in the upper echelon of college football. So... We need to try and breeze through the rest of this. But before we get to that. Last round. Last round. Round six of draft day. Round six. Derek, beer guy, bring Derek, it on. Sir, we are ready for you. Probably need to drink more water. You need to. All right. All righty. Come on back, Derek. Derek, sir, what do we have? Uh, this beer right here is the right here? nightcap of all nightcaps. It's a great dessert. Uh, it is 10% beer. Whoa! Dessert beer. It is an imperial stout, which Hello, is Chris Carnage. <laughs> oh, Chris Carnage is coming out tonight. It, it, it's happening. It is happening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Woo! Um, this beer is just laughing his ass off. <laughs> yes, our producer is probably hating this right now, <laughs> the, or just waiting to see how crazy I get. Party, party. Please don't fire me, producer. Party, party. Please. Um, it's called S'mores. S'mores. So it's going to taste like s'mores. I'm not going to lie. Southern Tier is great. Like it. Smells great like s'mores. on this. You got the graham cracker. Makes me need a fart. Oh, yeah. There was a frog in here, ladies and gentlemen. There yeah, there was a frog, frog on that Harley. Yeah. Um, Harley? <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. So it's, it's sorry for his, uh, his Southern Tier uh, out of PA, New York area. Um, okay. It is. Oh, it smells oh, like yeah. a Hershey bar. It's like a Hershey bar. Very it light, tastes, though. It tastes really good. Wow. Look at that back. It's not light. It's medium body. Um, you get the graham cracker. You get the oh, little yeah. bit of the, vanilla, uh, the marshmallow with uh, a little bit of chocolate, but more of the graham cracker, if you guys agree with on that. It really, this, like, it's amazing to me what breweries can do nowadays and how they can make, they can just seriously just put in, infuse it with whatever they want it to You know why? Like. Science. Science is Science amazing. rules. Science is amazing. Science, thing. ladies and gentlemen, and kids, but this is not a kids show. <laughs> so um, This is a family show. Family show. Well, maybe, maybe not today. Parental advisory. Maybe not so much today because we got draft day on tap. But I tell you what, this is really amazing, real good taste. And what I love is that as you drink it, the aftertaste, that's where he starts tasting the graham cracker and the s'mores yes. effect, is that it kind of comes in there at the end. It's like a nice little pleasant hoorah. You get more of the graham cracker marshmallow than you do the chocolate. Uh, through the yes. body, uh, through the tongue there, but it's a very uh, medium to to full body. Yeah, it's very delicious. I mean, this yes, is, very much so. I've honestly never tasted anything like this in a beer before. Yes. What was this it's called me. again? This is s'mores. And who makes Southern this? Tier. Uh, Southern. Southern Tier. And Southern Tier is a great brewery. They've been around for a long time. Uh, they produce a lot of oh, great. Great dessert beers, in my opinion. They have a beer called Cream Brulee. Uh, they have a beer, um, the vanilla custard beers. The main one. They have a lot of great dessert beers, and you can't go wrong with Southern Tier at all. So you said this is out of the Pennsylvania and New York yeah. area. Yes. Yeah, this is this is delicious. I've never had this before. This is very good. Yeah, this yeah. is really good. I really enjoy this. Ten percent, ladies and gentlemen. Ten percent. Chris Carnage coming out tonight. Delicious, and it'll. You know, get you drunk. So, Ooh, so tasty. As Samuel Jackson would say, "It'll get you drunk." <laughs> Good old Samuel Jackson. Can't go wrong right. with that. Derek, the beer guy. But we'll bring. Gentlemen. But we'll bring you back on when we make our final pick of the night. Yeah. Sorry for the pick of the month. The pick of the month. draft yes. day. Thank you so much, Derek. Thank and, you so uh, much. So on the top twenty-five countdown, we were just rounding out the top fifteen. We're at number sixteen. And uh, number 16, I have Washington, which you've already previously stated. Washington at 10-4, and 7-2 in the Pac-12 North. Jacob Eason is going to be the uh, next quarterback. He's a transfer from Georgia. Yep. And he's going to come in and take over for Jake Browning. Uh, but this is a Chris Peterson team, so you know they're always going to be a factor in the Pac-12. 
Oh, most definitely. Most definitely going to be a factor. At my 16, I have Iowa, who did lose some offensive firepower, but do return some good starters on offense and defense. So the Iowa Hawkeyes definitely could make some noise in the Big Ten. So definitely watch out for them going forward. But at 17, though, I have the Penn State Nittany Lions, who did lose their starting quarterback in the NFL draft in McSorley, but are always good at recruiting. Penn State is a very popular school. So we'll definitely see how they come out with their new quarterback and see what they're able to bring to the table. They're still strong defensively and still return the running back, if I'm not mistaken. So definitely watch out for Penn State next season. Yeah, my number 17, I have Washington State out of the Pac-12. They went 11-2 last year, 7-2 in the Pac-12 North, tied with Washington for the lead. So they're coming off a school record 11 wins last year, and they have a transfer from Eastern Washington named Gage Gubrud. Mm. Gubrud. G-U-B-R-U-D. Gubrud. 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 Yeah, Gubrud. 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 <laughs> but, Please don't sue us. <laughs> but, so the big thing about it, he was twice named a finalist for the Walter Payton Award, which is given to the best offensive player in FCS, Division One AA. And he threw for more than 5,000 yards in 2016, a couple years ago at Eastern Washington. So I think... You know Mike Leach is always going to be bringing that kind of an offense, oh. and he can utilize another veteran quarterback in his offense. They're going to be in the mix in the Pac-12 North with Oregon and Washington. That Mike Leach loves having big-armed quarterbacks that can just bomb it down the field, and he's able to take those guys and make them into successful quarterbacks. So definitely will be interesting to see what Washington State does there. But at 18, I have Iowa State, which is a little bit more surprising given the amount of talent that they lost last year. Even though they only did go 8-5-6-3 and five and six and three in Big 12 play, they were able to have great playmakers at not only running back, but at wide receiver with guys like Nikhil Harris. So it's definitely going to be interesting to see how this team bounces back. I definitely think they can make some noise in a Big 12 that's not really known for defense. Defense, so they might be able to come out and make some noise. I think you mean Hakeem Butler. I don't know. I'm Nikhil Harry went to Arizona State. Don't mind me. I've been drinking in their same colors, so <laughs> it all works. But Hakeem Butler, same one. So 18, you've got Iowa State. I have Stanford at number 18 here. Ooh, a again, little high. Again in the Pac-12, it's a little bit high, but all three of Stanford's non-conference opponents have been ranked in the top 25. They got Notre Dame, UCF, and Northwestern. Uh, they're going to have one of the most difficult four game stretches, but I think they only. I think they, they have a little bit of an identity crisis right they now. They do. They, they do a bit of an identity crisis. They only have three returning offensive starters and five on defense. So I think, but Shaw knows how to get his guys ready to play. He mm -hmm. knows how to coach guys up. So I think there there might be a little high in my opinion right now, but I have them in that mix to be in the Pac-12. Well, at 19, I have Northwestern. Uh, Northwestern did go 9-5 and five last year, 8-1 and one in Big Ten play, uh, and was able to make uh, the championship game, if I wasn't mistaken, for the Big Ten. They actually were the first team to win the Big Ten West since, like, Wisconsin's done it the last yep. couple of years. They've been the first non Big Ten West winner in a number of years. Yes, absolutely. And Fitzgerald's done a great job with this team. They do return the starting quarterback, who's a great quarterback, and now he's going to be coming into his own to really make some noise this upcoming season. So definitely look out for uh, Northwestern because I think they could uh, possibly make a return trip to the Big Ten given how weakened their division is. Yeah, the Big Ten West is really going to be an interesting uh, conference uh, division this year. At number 19, you are going to love this one. So, Oh, am we, I going to lose my we, mind? We each have teams that are not in each other's top 25. I actually don't have Iowa in my top 25 at all. Look at you. But Bite your tongue. My number 19 team. You have Northwestern. I yep. have Northwestern at number 20. I'll talk about them in a second. I have Nebraska at number 19. Nebraska, I know... I think my head's going to explode. I'm pretty sure because it almost splattered against the wall there. Yes, it did. So even though Nebraska went 4-8 and eight last year and 3-6 and six in the Big Ten West, they started 0-6, but they finished 4-2. and two, all five, So five of their eight losses were by five points or less, three of those being on the road. Quarterback Adrian Martinez, he looked really good mid to late last season, and he should take a giant leap forward for Scott Frost. Now, here's, here's part that always plays into everything, the schedule. Nebraska's schedule. They play Ohio State, Northwestern, Wisconsin, and Iowa all at home. Lucky. Northwestern, Iowa, and, and Wisconsin are all divi in division, yes. so those are going to be huge. 
Absolutely. And here's the other thing. Nebraska does not play Michigan, Michigan State, or Penn State this year in the regular season. Who they pay off? I don't know, but they apparently they got the luck of the draw this year. I think they take a huge ah. I think they take a huge leap forward in year two of Scott Frost, and I think they have a winning season and they could potentially compete for the Big Ten West here. I can't believe beating, I'm gonna say this. Beating Northwestern. Oh my gosh. I gotta say this. Alright, so in Nebraska Nebraska's a dumpster fire. Scott Frost is a great head coach. Don't get me wrong. Not a dumpster fire. Just because you go four and two in your last six don't mean crap. Because the thing I look at is that, yeah, you might have what, lost five of your eight games by three points or less. Whether you win by an inch or a mile, winning's winning. The same is true for losing. Because there's a reason you lost. You weren't good enough. So You're also looking at, you're also looking at a, an organization that was there last year. Yes. And their coach was, oh, gee shucks, guys. We just lost the game. Oh, I guess we're just okay with it. That's the kind of coach they had in Mike Riley. That's very true. I mean, they have a strong. They have a strong. Uh, they have a strong uh, athletic department. Yes, they do. The athletic director. That's they who do. they wanted. They wanted Scott Frost. They do, and I think Scott Frost is a good coach. And I think he can do great things. So but don't call him a dumpster fire. Okay, how about this? You get you get a uh, garbage can fire. <laughs> you get you get a thirteen a scale. You get a thirteen gallon kitchen garbage can fire. Hey, you guys have seen it here first. Woo! He's gonna eat his words when Nebraska comes out swinging in the first part of the year, and this dude's eating his words over it's here. It's okay. Plenty of teams have made me do that this year already, so it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's, it's a common the theme for this guy over here. I like to eat it. But uh, who do you? Go- you got number. You got Northwestern at number nineteen. I have Northwestern at number twenty. Uh, big reason they did win the Big Ten West last year. They get Clemson quarterback transfer Hunter Johnson, who was ESPN had rated as the top pocket passer in twenty seventeen. Yeah, they did. And they're going to be defending the Big Ten West. Hopefully, it'll give them a little bit of a spark on offense. I think Northwestern's going to be in a battle with Nebraska, Wisconsin, and Iowa, all for the Big Ten West. That's definitely going to be an interesting play out, especially with the Big Ten West. And honestly, with how so many teams took a step back, it's kind of made that division more even. So it'll definitely be interesting to see how that works Much out. Much more wide open. Who do you yes. got at number 20? So at number 20, I have the Utah Utes. Now, while I do think Utah's a great team, I didn't think they were – that great. I feel like he kind of fell into a lot of positions because other teams in front of them ended up just faltering. So with Utah going nine and five, six and three in Pac-12 play, I think they definitely have a chance to try and make it back. But I don't know if they'll actually do it, and that would be the big point of that. And you got to look at the other teams in that division: USC trash, UCLA yes. trash, yes, uh, Arizona State could not win a string of games to save their <laughs> life. And now I have Herm Edwards as their head coach. I mean, well, last year was his first year. Yes, so and that's what I'm saying. They have him, and they also brought in, oh, my goodness, I can't even remember right now. Who's hey, the coach they brought in as an assistant? I know who you're talking about. I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head. It's going to bug but, me. Uh, it, it's going to bug both of us until the end of the show. But um, so you have Utah at number 20. Uh, at number 21, I actually have Iowa State. So you had Iowa State earlier. Uh, you had Iowa State earlier in your uh, top 25. I have them at 21 because yes, they did come off an eight and five record last year, six and three in the Big 12. Quarterback Brock Purdy is set to become a breakout star for the Cyclones. So it'll be really interesting to see how Matt Campbell uh, keeps his guys all around that top 25. I think they'll be in the contention in the Big 12 with Texas and with. Oklahoma potentially it really depends on how their schedule is going to lay out for them for Iowa State. All right, and to bring it back to Arizona State real quick, that Did was find out who that, that was, was Marvin Lewis, Marvin Lewis who Lewis came Lewis. on as a head special coach, advisor, head coach for the Bengals. That's right. Hey, hey, so hey that dumpster fire. You're saying you're going to bring on a bunch of uh, convicts now? I mean, they could. You're in Arizona State. It's the number one populated school in all of college. Uh, well, period. So that for being said, STDs, you, maybe you can sneak in a lot of guys, right? <laughs> To sneak them on in. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I'm who sure. Do got, who do you got at number 21, though? So at number 21, I also have Washington State, uh, who did play great last year and honestly exceeded expectations under Mike Leach and was able to honestly battle through a lot of, of bad situations that happened to them with their, with their starting quarterback who ended up committing suicide. It was very, very sad. Uh, they turned to their backup who did play really good. Uh, so it's definitely interesting to see what Washington State's going to do. They definitely made noise last year in the Pac-12, but we'll definitely see if they can keep it sustained. That's the big thing. They did go in 11 and two, and they won the Apple Cup against Washington. But it, I don't know if they have enough to try and take that next step to win a Pac-12 title. 
But at number 22, to keep the ball rolling, I have the Wisconsin Badgers, who did go 8-5 and five last year and 5-4 and four in Big Ten play. Uh, the division really did catch up to the Badgers in 2018, as a lot of things came a lot closer, and obviously they didn't even win the division at the end of the day uh, like they had it many years before. However, they did have their quarterback, uh, Alex Hombrook, who had recurring head injuries uh, that prevented them from starting for the previous four seasons. Um, but they do have quarterback Graham Mertz, who definitely – should slide in as a top-rated quarterback passer and the number one 21, the number of 21 overall recruits. Sorry, I've been drinking way too much. I see that clearly in the 2019 class. It's hard to string words together, <laughs> um, but he could be keep, compete for the starting spot. The big thing with Wisconsin, though, is that they didn't do really great in the passing game. However, they've always been known as a run-first team. Right. They have boasted great, great running backs like Donald Pumphrey, for instance. We ended up going Ron on to a, name? Hey, Ron Dane, man. Great <laughs> players. And they've always been known for that old school, three yards and a cloud of dust type of football. So we'll definitely see how Wisconsin ends up shaping up going into the next season. But who you got? I also have Wisconsin at number 22. Uh, I think it's really going to be tough for them this year to try to win the Big Ten West again because you've got teams like Northwestern, mm-hmm. Iowa, uh, Nebraska all, all jockeying for that Big Ten West title. But Heisman Trophy candidate Jonathan Taylor returns at running back, uh, but they must improve on that passing game, and they do have those quarterbacks that you mentioned. Yes. Uh, so hopefully, if you're a Wisconsin Badger, that will be a step in the right direction in the passing game moving forward. But I have Wisconsin number 22. I don't see them winning the Big Ten West this year. Uh, number 23, I have Penn State. So I know mm. you had them a little bit earlier. Yep. Here's the big reason why. Penn State... Not only were they a bit, they had some uh, veterans last year. They lost a lot of veterans. Yes, they did. They're going to be a very young team in 2019. Also, a big, a big key for me. Yes, they recruit well. Yes, it's a good school they like to go to. But five underclassmen entered the NFL draft and 11 others, mostly grad transfers, but 11 other players also entered the, dr- the transfer portal. That's true. Out of Penn State. So I don't see, especially in the Big Ten East, you've got Michigan. You've got Ohio State. You've even got a team that's not listed on either of our rosters of Michigan State. They play better than they have. Than they, than they, they generally. initially ranked. So they generally play a little bit better. But you've got a you've you knew this when you were the Big Ten and you separated them into divisions. The Big Ten East is always going to be loaded. Yes. So I think it's going to be a little bit too loaded for Penn State, but their non-conference schedule and for some of their other games against lesser conference teams, I think will push them up kind of in the end of the top 25. Definitely. So who do you got for number 23? So at 23, I have Stanford, uh, the Stanford Cardinal, who did go 9-4 and four last year, 6-3 and in Pac-12 play. They definitely are a team that is trying to bounce back. They did lose a lot of players, like you mentioned earlier, into the draft and through graduation, including one Bryce Love, which is definitely going to be a big hit, even though he did get injured at the end of last season. So we'll definitely see how Stanford's able to bounce back. But Stanford and uh, head coach Shaw have always been able to recruit very, very well to Stanford ever since they were able to enjoy the extreme success of Andrew Luck. So I think Stanford could have the potential to bounce back, especially in their division. So it really just depends upon how they're able to get everybody going uh, as a whole, especially on offense. Uh, but looking at 24, I have also have – Actually, we both have the same teams we, at 24 and 25. We have the same teams at 24 and 25. So I'll take the lead with 24 with Auburn. We both have Auburn, who went 8-5, and 5-3 five, five and three in SEC play. They did lose their starting quarterback, Jarrett Stidham, to the NFL. He's actually the quarterback that went to New England. Yes, he was the quarterback that went to New England. The quarterback you are talking about before, uh, Finley, went yes. to uh, Cincinnati. Yes. Ryan Finley. <coughs> Don't mind me, I've been drinking. So, <laughs> that being said, uh, Auburn did lose quarterback Jarrett Stidham to the NFL. But they do have uh, a true freshman and a redshirt freshman quarterback that are currently vying for the starting position. So it definitely will be very interesting. Both were very highly touted recruits, but we'll definitely see who comes out in that race. So who do we got at 25? Rounding out the top 25, we both have the Army Knights, the Golden Knights. Uh, Army is coming off an 11-2 season, one of their best seasons in their 125-year history, yes. winning 11 games for the first time. Time ever. They ever. Retain, they retain their head coach, uh, Jeff Monken, and they return their quarterback, Kelvin Hopkins Jr. He's actually the first Army player ever to pass and run for more than a thousand yards in a season 
So I think based on their schedule, they do have some tough games. They played Michigan early in the year. So I think they're going to have a few losses. They're going to take a few lumps. But overall, I think they'll be okay. I think they definitely can. Because the thing with service academies, you never know really what you're going to get. Navy obviously recently experienced uh, the most success of all the service academies being able to obviously upend my Notre Dame Fighting Irish to be able to get their first win in that series. Uh, But at the end of the day, I still think they could be able to keep things rolling and be able to capitalize, really, and at least try and repeat what they did last season, especially things that, like you mentioned, they're returning their starting quarterback who's been able to make noise. So it definitely will be interesting, but coming at the end of this, we're at the end of our top 25. At the end of the top 25, and if you want a complete uh, overview of the top 25 from both of us, we're actually going to be posting these out as uh, as stories. Uh, we're actually going to be doing... Actually, gonna be doing new stories here uh, in a, a a new surprise that you got for us here. That's right. You're gonna hear it here first. Final score is now starting its own sports blog. That way, if you want to keep up on all the written stories that are happening in the NFL, Major League Baseball, in the NBA, doesn't matter what facet of the sports. We have now final score writers that are going to be contributing to the sports blog. So definitely make sure that you check it out. It's at www.podcastcity.net backslash final score hyphen blog so definitely make sure you check it out and there will actually be a link on the final score page uh, that can take you right to that blog and can see all the updates from all the writers of the final score team Uh, as we go we're trying to keep content rolling for you throughout the week every week and uh, try to bring some of the big stories that maybe we cover on the show but also things that we don't have time to get to on the show we want to cover them throughout the week so, yeah, it definitely is going to be really amazing. We have a lot of great contributors, guys who have been in the field writing sports journalism. So you're definitely going to get a nice, tactful eye on all of these sports and all the different things that are going on. So definitely make sure that you go check it out. Definitely a big part. So all you have to do is go to podcastcity.net, click on the final score link. We'll scroll down a little bit on the left, click on sports blog, and you definitely will be able to find all of our latest sports stories, contributions from myself, from Craig, and also from a lot of other great contributors that we have covering Major League Baseball, covering football. It's going to be really great. Definitely make sure that you check it out. It's going to be awesome. But with that, we got to give away another prize. Giving away another prize. Let's we are going to give away another prize. And on this one, we have a Pittsburgh Penguins baseball style jersey. It's very nice. It's Pittsburgh right across the front. It's I think there's a Pittsburgh fan here that might want this. Pittsburgh fan. But, you know, we got to see who It looks kind of gross to me. I mean, you think it's gross. I call this a jersey. But, you know, (laughs) I mean, it is what it is. Don't dip it in your beer. I'll dip it in the beer. I think you'd like that. If I can light it on fire afterwards. (laughs) I can't keep a straight face on that one. (laughs) But we'll definitely throw this out. Hey, there's a guy over here. There you go. Have some fun with that. So definitely going to be a great time. So... Man, we're coming near the end of all this. Yeah, we gotta, we got not too much left. We're just going to wrap it up. we got to do our week ahead. What are you looking forward to in the coming week? Well, we do have the MLB draft starting on Monday, June 3rd, and running through June 5th. It's going to be great. It starts on June 3rd at 7 p.m. Make sure you check it out. Uh, and also... One of our writers, Rod Nunez, is also on the Final Score blog, released a recent story about his projections for the top 10 picks in the MLB draft. So definitely make sure you go over to www.podcastcity.net backslash final score hyphen blog, and you will find that story there. But what else we got going on? Uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the NBA and NHL playoffs. Uh, we have... We're going to be getting right into the meat of each of these series. Of course, we talked about Game 3 of the Stanley Cup Finals is going on right now behind us. Yes. Uh, as well as the NBA Finals. The Game 2 is tomorrow night on Sunday. So we'll be looking forward to see how each of these two series are going to play out uh, over the next week. Yeah, definitely going to be amazing. But also, in a more local sense for the upcoming week, make sure to check out Bearded Dragon Trivia. It is new in-house trivia here at City Limits Tap Room. You can check them out at, at Bearded Dragon Trivia. Uh, they're going to be here every Tuesday night as part of Guys Night from 7 to 9. So definitely make sure you come down, check it out, and win yourself some prizes. It's going to be a great time. I know I enjoy it. So definitely make sure you come out and check that out. But I think that's all we have for the week ahead. So that leaves us with... One thing left, right? One thing left. We got to bring Derek back in. That's right, Derek the beer guy. We got to make our pick of the month for draft day. Our draft pick of the month. 
Draft day pick of the month. So I'm not that pick right here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so what what do you got right there? What do you what do you sipping what are you on? sipping on there? That is the S'mores Imperial Stout. Ah, I love my ah. Imperial Stouts, uh, and you can blame it on alcohol. The ABV on that is ten percent. It'll get you drunk. Definitely um, will. So, of of all six beers, we had Tuker, Hellas, Hefeweizen. We also had Flamingo Dream on Nitro. We had Saint Bernardus Prior Eight. Lord Hobo, Broom Sauce, Dewclaw, Sweet Baby, Jesus, and Southern Tier S'mores Imperial Stout. Um, my vote is is for this dessert beer, S'mores. S'mores, um, that's a good one. Southern Tier. What is your your picks? Uh, honestly, I think I'd have to go with the uh, Dewclaw, Sweet Baby, Jesus. I, I really enjoyed that one. It has good drinkability, and you can't beat a name like Sweet Baby Jesus. That is true. I do. I do love that name. Uh, I, this is a really tough list to pick from. You gave us a very tough list. Uh, I'm going to have to go with the s'mores as well. Oh. I, I really liked it. I was going to go with Sweet Baby Jesus, but as soon as I sip that, game over. <laughs> so I, I'm going with the s'mores. So I guess that I thought makes, I was going to be the rebel. You thought you were, but I guess the s'mores Imperial Stout is our draft day pick of the month. So definitely make sure that you come down here to City Limits Tap Room at 2620 North Woodland Boulevard in D-Land, Florida. D-Land. And check out all the great drafts, including... The Imperial style. That was, that was one good Imperial style. I tell yes. you what, it is. It yeah, is. I appreciate you bringing all those uh, those flights to us. Those are some delicious. Yes, beers it was a lot of work. Absolutely, it was weighed a lot. And, <laughs> walk back and, forth. and now, now you're drunk and go enjoy your go enjoy yes. your endeavors. Thank I you will. so much for joining us, Derek. You know, Always man. a pleasure. Appreciate it. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much. Too we look great. forward to seeing you again. Yes. yes. All right. Well, sadly, this is the end of yet another. Not only draft day, but episode 16 of Final Score. Definitely make sure that you check out Podcast City Network on all of their outlets. On Facebook at backslash Podcast City Network. On Twitter at Podcast City Net. And of course at our website, podcastcity.net. But where can they find us for Final Score? Uh, Final Score, you can find us on Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, uh, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Stitcher. Just search keyword final score. You can find us also, like you said, on Twitter and Facebook at PCN Final Score. Yeah, so definitely Lots make of avenues to find us. Yeah, a lot of avenues. So definitely make sure that you go on to those avenues. Give us a like, give us a follow, give us a subscription, and check out all the great things that we have going on as we always try to bring you guys the very, very best. But this is the end of episode 16 of Final Score and Draft Day here on Podcast City Network. We thank you so much for joining us here on Twitch. Make sure that you check us out next week for episode 17 of Final Score. But until then, I'm Chris, and this is Craig, and this has been Final Score. You have a great night.